it's been a few weeks. We've uh, we've had a crazy time. Tim's been on Film Week. I've been on Film Week. The Academy Awards. Really? Uh, you know what, Tim, we have to start off with talking about the Academy Awards. We got a whole bunch of Oscar nominees and winners in yeah. uh, in this week's Blu-ray and DVD uh, releases. But I have to say, immediately, almost immediately after the Oscars, there was this amazing show here. I, I guess it was locally in L.A., but. There was this really, really just amazing <laughs> pair of film critics on that show. I was so impressed. Did you manage to see that? I did not actually, if you want me, because I was because I was one of. Them. Hey, uh, oh. Puig, uh of course, president of Los Angeles Film Critics Association, in Lilo Me, got to do the post Oscar show, of course, with George Pinocchio, who, of course, is a, a regular figure for you know Southern California. Yeah. You know, we know George Pinocchio, entertainment business, uh, forty years here. Uh, and, and, and we were lucky enough to get a chance to do the sort of post Oscar show, which happened to be broadcast sort of nationally ish, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. No, but it was, the, the, it, it was, you guys did great. I, the thing that, that, that I found a little bit vexing is that that entire thing is structured for people with no attention span. By the way, we should say oh. Tim has a little bit of sexy modulation on his voice here today. <laughs> so it's, uh, get a little, we're getting a little Barry White action out of him um but it, it's like that thing you i mean every one of your segments was about 35 36 seconds long and and that blaring music that no. like techno music that's just dry you said that was thumping in your ear the whole time oh yeah like you know you have the little the little little lion and, th- and, that, and yeah. all of that those pieces with that music and i'm like is this mixed this badly or is this correct is it supposed yeah. to sound this terrible uh and i guess it did uh the word was and you're right those little packages you know we sort of constructed to suck up as much time. How did you? How do you even think when it's when it's kicking in your ear like that? You know what I did is I just sort of backed it off a little bit, so yeah. that really just sort of because otherwise, literally, and you, you you do have a little pack behind, but just you can turn it down, but you have to figure out a way to get under your coat and all of that. So I just backed it off a little bit. But you know, it was an okay, it was it was an okay little sort of post show post. I mean, I, we were the least in, in, intriguing things about the Academy Awards this year, of course. You know, uh, Academy Awards. COVID uh, edition, part of it at Union Station, part of it at the, uh, what's, what's that theater called now in Hollywood? I forget. Oh, the, the Kodak now. It's Kodak now. Um, uh, it's, yeah. it's changed name like three times. Since they it. had people in the UK and they kind of had people scattered around the globe uh, in a few places too. Yeah. Um, so overall, overall thoughts, you know, we've, uh, we've not talked a lot about it. Um, I know you, you know, you met your, your thoughts were mostly shared on the, on the after, after show. So, I mean, my feeling is it was a no win scenario. Mm. It was always going to be a bad show. It was always going to be a super low rated show. I mean, their ratings collapsed. They had, you know, I think they wound up gaining a few more after the final numbers were in, but it was still, you know, the, the lowest rated Oscars in history by more than 50%. Well, of course, last um, year's Oscars was the lowest rated Oscars in history in and, last year. Well, um, and last year was lowest rated at 25 million and they got barely 12 million this year. So yeah. it's it just, it's it, the audience collapsed. And um, I think partly because nobody had seen any of the movies. Mm. Um, no Man Land is the lowest rated, be- or the lowest uh, attended, lowest grossing best picture in history um, relative to, you know, tickets sold and eyeballs that have fallen on the film. Mm. Um, so, I mean, all that said, I, I, I think they, they kind of bungled an opportunity, but, um, I, it, in a way it's rock bottom. And I think, um, I think they're up in, they, they now know what they need to do next year. Well, I think they need to do something different. They, they know where they need to go. Yeah. And your hindsight is 2020, but some of these things didn't require, um, a hindsight to, to, to realize that they wouldn't work for, for a moment though. Let's talk about some of the stuff that did work. The um, Union Station here in Los Angeles as a location so that they could socially distance and do all this kind of stuff. That was not a terribly bad idea. It looked good. Uh, yeah. it, it was all, it was laid out rather nicely. How they used Union Station with these folks sort of wandering about with, uh, with boom mics and all that kind of stuff. That was not a good use of Union Station. But the sort of iconic station in and of itself, you know, Union Station is in all kinds of movies, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I didn't, you know, okay with that, you know, sort of the way we, we put these things around. The idea, of course, is they didn't want anybody zooming in ha- as had been the case for pretty much everybody uh, for all the other award shows. You know, yeah. And, uh, so they didn't want that. So they've had to figure out, okay, no problem with that. We're okay so far. Now, the notion, though that we were still going to attempt to make the Academy Awards as big and lavish a show as it always has been. While we are still in the midst of this pandemic, 
that I think was a bad idea, which means that they should have written a much, much tighter, shorter, cleaner show yeah. and, 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 and allowed all of that to lean into the fact that we are at all these venues and just you just take all of the stuff and you condense it down real tight and neat and clean, which is what I thought they might do. I mean, you know, you hire Steven Soderbergh. I figured, you know, he might run this thing like a nice little tight noir or something, you know. But yeah. no, they, can't, they 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 want the, the people wandering and chatting and 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 and, and going and so and the speeches were not controlled at all. Nobody got played on or off or any of that. Uh, and I just thought that that was a terrible mistake. No, um, um, keep it. T- it should be it should be ten times tighter than it ever was. Is what it should be. And and the writing has always been a problem on the Oscars. I mean, there have been years, you know, you can go back into the 70s and the early 80s when there were some there were some pretty well written shows. But on, on balance, I'd say for over 25 years, this has not been a well written show. It's just there, there's too much banter. There are too many jokes that don't pan out. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There's just there's too much just superfluous stuff. You know, we always talk about that. They're always cutting the songs because they think the songs take too long or they're cutting the clips or they want to cut the, um, uh, the, the acceptance speeches down. But the two things that they never cut, which they should is number one, the banter and the bad jokes. Mm -hmm. And number two, fewer commercials. I mean, if you're, you know, I, I get it. The commercials are the whole point of the thing for ABC and for the Academy is to earn money. But, I think a commercial spot would be worth a little bit more money if there were a few of them. Yeah, um, a few yeah. or fewer better and, and make themselves iconic sort of spots. Um, the banter. Kill the banter. Ugh, the only people who it. should be doing any banter whatsoever are the people for whom banter comes naturally and therefore right. they need no one to write them any banter. Right. Um, if, if, if Tom Hanks is the presenter, you don't need to write him any banter. And Tom Hanks can probably get away with some banter. He's Tom Hanks. So, Will, so, Will so, Ferrell. Will Ferrell can write his own banter. They'll, if, and, you know, and they'll, so either either you will come with or you 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 will simply do the job yeah. that you've been handed. If you're Faye Dunaway, <laughs> you know what? Open yeah. the envelope, read the name. <laughs> 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 that's, that's, that's what we want you to do, Faye. Don't try to be funny. Um, but you know, you know, which means that you would you wouldn't necessarily be doing away with banter. There would still be plenty of clever people who would say clever things. Um, uh, but it would, you know, Nathan, like, it, but but it would come naturally. It, they would get in, they yeah. would get out, they would have the timing, that Billy Crystal kind of thing, and you wouldn't be forcing banter into the mouths of people who are not capable of doing banter. I I think. A big, and let's talk just for a second about next year, and then we'll jump in because one of the films we're going to talk about this week on Blu-ray will take us, will transition perfectly as No Man Land. Um, but I think a, a good way to start out next year, bring back a host. I think people miss the host. I want to give them two choices, two really great choices, and and I don't think you can go wrong with either of them. Bring back Billy Crystal. I get it. He's old. He doesn't appeal to the 18 to 34 advertiser, you know, coveted demo. But but those people aren't watching the show anyway. Mm -hmm. Give up on them. We're watching the show. If you're in your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, you know, come on, bring Billy Crystal back. A little bit of nostalgia. Lock that audience down. More disposable income anyway. All of those Mercedes Benz and Rolex commercials will be much better received by that audience. So bring back Billy or if it's not Billy. Now that we got all that Kevin Hart nonsense out of our system, let mm-hmm. Kevin Hart do it. Let him do it. Well, look, everybody kind of threw their tantrum about that when it was done. You know what? Kevin Kevin's behaved himself and and carried himself on rather bravely since he had a near death accident. He's recovered from that. I I think any issues that anybody had with Kevin Hart, like I don't, I still don't understand why anybody has issues with Kevin Hart to begin with. But you know what? Kevin Hart is an exemplary human right now. A wonderful guy. He's very funny. He wants to host the Oscars. Let him have his fairy tale ending. Uh, uh, Kevin was fine with me for doing the Oscars in the first place. I mean, they, all of that came through. Whatever. I just, I, 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 I could have ignored all of that. The, the problem, of course, is that you know whether it's Kevin or pretty much anyone else that they would tap uh, as a as as a, as a host, they will they will hear henceforth and forever simply have to go through the gauntlet of the public. Uh, yeah. the public will just forever, whenever a host is chosen, decide to do that thing that they do. 
uh, where they go back yeah. and look at all tweets forever and, 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 and so on and so forth. So eventually you get to a point where, you know, there aren't going to be a whole lot of people who would be perfectly deserving. Now, it, it, sometimes we get tired of that. Sometimes the public will sort of wear itself out doing that. Um, um, you know, if we're, you know, we, 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 we decide we're going to go after somebody. Sometimes they do. And they start to realize that if we keep doing that, nobody's going to host anything anymore. So who knows? Maybe we might hit that spot. Kevin, Kevin, you, you'll, you'll forget that the way that all ended, or sometimes we forget, the way that all ended is uh, the, the Academy said sorry. Um, uh, the Academy and Ellen <laughs> asked yeah. Kevin uh, to do the Academy Awards. And Kevin, in a very, you know, a nice way, said, nah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and then he went on about his life. Uh, and well, I, I, it, I, I'm okay with that. It's very funny, too. You know, if you haven't seen Sticks and Stones, the uh, Dave Chappelle routine on Netflix, there's a whole point in there where, you know, Dave goes out for his friends. Like, he defends Louis C.K. in a whole part of that. And there's somebody I think who'd be great as an Oscar host, and people could kind of let him back into the circle. But um, uh, but Louis, Louis has a, a few more mea culpas to do. But And then he goes on and he defends Kevin. It's very funny. He says, but Kevin, he stuck to his conscience. He said, I will not apologize and then he went on television and apologized for two weeks, uh, which which was kind of true. But nonetheless, I do think that at this point, if they went back to Kevin and said, "Please come on back," let's you know, let's make amends. Uh, I think he'd do it. I think I, he'd I, do look, it. I, I look. It'd be funny who 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 could do it and could do it uh, even 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 after all of that sort of public stuff that happens would be would be Dave Chappelle. Uh, Dave Chappelle sure. could do it. Uh, if the public uh, decided to go and do that thing that they do, uh, first of all, you, you can't really dig up much on Dave Chappelle. It's, it's pretty much, it's pretty much all there. Um, uh, I, um, and there, he wouldn't there give are, a damn anyway. So these are the people who I think that they really should think about going to. And we're, we're not talking about, you know, this is not, this is not a heavy lift, but if you want to get a really rock solid host, there are a number of comics who do not have hosting cred who could do this. And, you know, Conan has done his bits and Jimmy Fallon has done his bits. And, you know, like we, we know who the people are who've, who've done all their stuff. And, and, you know, uh, Jimmy Kimmel has done his bits, yeah. but we, but I think you're right. Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle, Jerry Seinfeld has yeah. never hosted anything. Yeah. Seinfeld could absolutely kill it. Seinfeld would be great. Yeah. Eddie it, it, Murphy, it, it, Eddie Murphy has never hosted anything. Yeah, yeah, and again, they're the venerable icons um, for whom you know whatever, whatever, whatever kind of funkiness anybody's ever had and, anything to say about has been and, said already. And Pat Oswalt, and Pat, Pat and, Oswalt and, would be and great. Pat wouldn't even have to withstand any of that because he he's right. just a minch um, all the way he's down great. the line. Uh, he's uh, just uh, great. Uh, um, um, some ladies. It would be nice to have some ladies on that list. Um, 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 sure. Tiffany Absolutely. Haddish seems to have. Uh, um, uh, I, I also, you know, Tiffany's in a, it's in a Billy, uh, Billy Crystal movie, by the way, that I'm reviewing yeah. for, uh, Tiffany, uh, seems to have, uh, it's been around a while now, you know, and, and I'll uh, tell and, you, I'll tell you who would also be a really good host. Uh, let him, let him get the Shang-Chi movie, the Marvel Shang-Chi thing. Let him get that out again. But I think Aquafina would be a great host too. There you go. There you go. You know. Uh, right. uh, and, and you can go that route where you really go with somebody. Hey, look, I mean, if, we, if we're going to go over there, then I'm going to put in a vote for Billy Porter. Uh, 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 Mr. Billy, Billy Porter, Porter could do it. Is, 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 aside, aside from uh, Billy Porter, don't take no crap from nobody. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, the wardrobe is going to be amazing. Uh, so you know, uh, <laughs> It'd be like it'd be like having share only not share. Yes, I get to share. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. But, yeah, so there you go. Uh, but yeah, anyway, Oscars. So the movies. The movie. So let's talk. Nomadland is out on Blu-ray. Uh, it's fairly bare bones. There are no extras on this. There's a little featurette here on the background of the film. It's called The Forgotten America. There's the uh, Q&A from Telluride with Francis McDormand and Chloe Zhao. And uh, they're deleted scenes. There is no audio commentary with Chloe Zhao, which leads me to think that there mm. may be some kind of a criterion or other mm. special edition in the offing at some point. For now, though, you will want to get this because even if a Criterion comes out, it will not have the movies anywhere code on it. This does. So, um, uh, but here's the funny thing: uh, they are they are not. This is this has two uh, two logos on it. It has obviously the Searchlight logo, 
and which is, of course, the name now. It's no longer Fox Searchlight since Disney acquired the entire operation as Searchlight. And then it also has the 20th Century Studios logo. And um, that's really interesting because, you know, William Fox's name now completely gone from wow. the former 20th Century Fox, which is ironic because it's the studio he founded. It only became 20th Century Fox in the mid-1930s, early 1930s, when um, Daryl Zanuck left Warner Brothers created his own operation with Joe Skank, who had, who had launched Buster Keaton's career, and they called it 20th Century Studios. And when they merged with Fox Film Studios, they became 20th Century Fox. And here we are all these decades and generations later, and it's, and it's, it's Zanuck's operation again, and William Fox is gone. The Fox name is gone. It's weird to me. Yeah. It's weird to me. I mean, obviously, because, you know, Fox lives on in the uh, in the other Fox universe, Fox Sports and yeah. Fox News Channel and all that stuff. But it's just interesting to me that, that you know, Fox was a movie guy. Yeah. It's weird that, that his name lives on in sports and news because he didn't give a damn about sports and news. He was about well, movies. You know, it was weird. It was it, it was. And, and, I, and when we started calling uh, Columbia Studios, you know, what we called yeah. Columbia, when we started calling it the Sony lot. Yeah, uh, you know, weird, and, right? and that Columbia. I never thought I'd do that. Yeah, and I, it, it, but you know, it, it, it just you know, when I first it was Columbia. Tim, how do we feel about Nomadland? Well, you look, uh, Nomadland uh, is 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 a lovely film uh, in the way that it is sort of captured in this sort of um, um, for folks who are sort of into Italian neo realism or something like that, Italian neo uh, neo realistic way. That sort of the Sika thing that Chloe Zhao is doing where she has all of these uh, actual people who are do doing what they do and being who they are. And then it sort of mixes in a couple of actors, Chris McDormand, Davis Theron, um, uh, to tell this story that's based on this book. Uh, Francis's character is, is whole cloth, not in the book. She's sort of a confabulation of some things. So, so there's an imprint of Chloe Zhao here beyond just the book, the stuff that yeah. she brings and the, and the other stuff that she brings in, the sort of, um, uh, working world stuff there. Some poignant, poignant stories. But to be honest with you, mostly Nomad Land, uh, lives in my mind with respect to its actual settings, that sort of, uh, physical landscape that Chloe is shooting quite beautifully out there in the middle of wherever they are uh, in the Southwest, uh, Southwestern United, United States. So um, it, 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 sort of, it sort of works on that level for me. As a narrative film, not so much, not really. I sort of peeled off the story about uh, you know half of the way through, and, and uh, it's, it's the kind of thing for me where I'll never watch that movie again with the sound up, right. but I may watch <laughs> it with the sound down. Oh, see, uh, now that's interesting. So, you know, it's, so that's, that's interesting. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, my, I've been, I've been saying it's one of those movies that I respect more than necessarily like. I didn't really enjoy watching it. Uh, I think it's, I, I don't think Chloe should edit her own films anymore. I understand why she did this one because there's all of that sort of, um, spontaneous and improvised stuff that, mm. that, that she wanted to be able to cut the way that it, 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 that she knew it needed to be cut. You turn that over to an editor there. You're just going to have to redo it anyway. Mm. So in a sense, you know, she almost had to edit this. Uh, but I think, I think having another editor, at least a companion editor to oversee her work and go, we can cut that. We can cut that. This movie needs to be about 15 minutes shorter. And oh, I think yeah. there's plenty of places you can take the, take the fat out. Um, here's the question that I have though. Would this, would this film have been in the running in any other year, if we had had, you know, like all the big movies that everyone expected to come out. And obviously we don't have an answer, a firm answer for that. I think, yes, this was always going to be in the running. Would it have won Best Picture had this been a normal year? Would Chloe Zhao have won Best Director? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Mm. Um, but, but would the film have made more money if people had seen it projected? Would it have been a more <laughs> popular film if you put these tapestries and this pacing on a big screen, I think definitely. Certainly, certainly with some of the scale at, at uh, with which she captures, you know, those, those scenic vistas and stuff of, of, of the Southwest. And you're, and you're right. You know, I don't know. It depends on what I guess the rest of the 
field would have been if it's, you know, if it's literally just this field. I, for one thing, I believed that in a, a different year, a normal year, where you know, people were going to the movies regularly, I think that you get Paul Green Grass's News of the World into the running. Yeah. People had been able to just go and see this just little big Paul Green Grass Tom Hanks film, which I thought was just a perfectly thrilling film. I think that's nominated. Um, um, and I think that if that film is nominated, then, then, then it's possible that that film might, because it's really just that good, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to my mind. Um, they both could have been nominated, of course. Um, and even, and even, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, there were some movies that, that opened, uh, that I, that I think that the producers of those films, I think the producers of Tenet, Chris, uh, Nolan at all thought that they had made a, an Academy Award nominatable film. Um, yeah. uh, and, and it turned out that, you know, theater, and, it, and it, I think it was the first film to sort of really put itself back in theaters, right? I mean, it was in theaters yeah. uh, and internationally and then yes, spot, spotily around the, the states. But, the, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, um, the pandemic or no, uh, people didn't, people didn't uh, take the tenant. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, you know, in, in, uh, under all conditions, I think Chloe Zhao kicks tenant's ass. <laughs> Even if it, you know, I, I, think I, I, think, right. I think it beats Tenet, but I'm not sure it beats News of the World if people had actually seen News. It's good point. Yeah, you know, so good I don't point. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, we also got uh, the uh, the animated best uh, the uh, the best animated Oscar winner, which is Soul, another Pixar winner, another Oscar yeah. for Pete Doctor. Uh, collaboration between Pete Doctor and playwright Kemp Powers, who also had a big year. Kemp Powers wrote the original play uh, One Night in Miami, which. Uh, was was turned into the uh, the the film, which uh, you know, beautifully directed by Regina King, got yeah. I think one or two nominations, but didn't really get any other love. I thought it should have been nominated in other categories for sure. But nonetheless, big year for Kent Powers, big year for Pete Doctor. Um, Soul, I don't think though, is a great Pixar film. I think it's extremely well done. I think it has some beautiful moments. Uh, I think thematically it's very touching. I love Jamie Foxx's um, incarnation of the lead character. As everybody knows, it's about a guy who, you know, uh, has everything going for him. He's going to get his big shot at jazz, jazz musician and a teacher, high school teacher. And then he dies. And there's this, you know, the, the journey of the of the soul that is, uh, that is sort of misbegotten and, um, you know, hooks up with another soul, which is a little kid soul. And there's this whole sort of afterlife uh, comedy drama going on. I think there's a lot of wonderful stuff here, but a little bit like uh, Inside Out, it it, it kind of doesn't all gel for me. It feels a little bit wayward at times, not like those tight old Pixar films that we used to get, you know, Finding Nemo and Toy Story and uh, and WALL-E. They were tight back then. And this one is uh, just feels like there's a little bit too much going on, but I still like it. I still like it a lot. Well, you look, it's, it's a, a perfectly affable movie. That score that, that, uh, uh Jean Baptiste and, and Trent yeah. Rester, uh, a sort of central score is absolutely beautiful. Whenever that score would, would, would float in, uh, with these beautiful, beautiful, sort of, uh, flourishes, you know, that, that was just sort of really, really, really sort of take me away. Yeah. You can, you're starting to see the sort of Pixar, the Pixar way. Uh, it's what you're starting to see. And the Pixar way is just starting to look like a way. I suppose this happens, though, with a lot of different animation, animation companies, animation. Uh, you know, they have the, they develop a way. And, uh, you know, Disney developed a way and Warner Brothers developed a way. And, the, and, 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 and that's that, you know, it's hard to, to criticize that. You know, this is what, uh, big old animation companies do. But when you, when it starts to become a way, that has in it a very particular context and the sort of execution that you can see coming. Yeah. Yep. You know, I become, I become less interested. So the other big film that I was nominated was, was Dead Wolf Walkers. Uh, yeah. film, uh, you know, from the folks who is Secret of Kells and all that. The Irish operation. The Irish yeah. operation over there. And it was, you know, this very, very striking piece of animation that, that I, you know, some people may or may not like. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, it, it, it didn't look like anything else. Um, yeah, and, uh, I love that film. The, the, the narrative in that story, you know, you know, it's some you know, Irish folk tale or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever with all that crap. I, so, so narratively, <laughs> um, um, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, the Pixar movie had some interesting things to say. It said it too much and too often, and it just looked a little too much like a Pixar film. Well, you got a lot of extras on here. There's an audio commentary, deleted scenes, behind the scenes stuff. Um, there's a whole whole featurette on the on the music. Uh, so you know you, you get you get a real and some you know real tribute to jazz on here. So it's loaded up. It also has a movies anywhere code. 
Uh, and uh, that one, you know, will probably be on Disney Plus before long as well. Here's another one. Promising Young Woman, which I thought was going to win Best Actress. It mm. did not for Carrie Mulligan. So Carrie Mulligan uh, goes home empty-handed yet again. Um, but this is another film, won Best Screenplay uh, yeah. for, for Emerald, Emerald Fennel, who has a big career now as well. You know, she and Chloe Zhao really got the, got the best out of this situation. But, um, you know, Promising Young Woman, would that have been in the mix in another year? Mm. I don't know. That's a tough one. First of all, that was a, that was a film that was sort of challenging for people in both directions. So I, th- yeah, and that's always sort of yeah. interesting when people you either really really like or really really don't like uh, uh, that movie. I will say this: the 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 it, it, one for what is it? The best original screenplay for Emerald, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what it was. Sure. Uh, to the extent that it, that it would would have been nominated or should have been nominated for an Academy Award for something, that is the exact right category. For it, best yeah. original screenplay, and I'm very happy that she won for that. Best, she was, she was also nominated for best director, you know, and, and you know, I don't know about that, you know, um, uh, so, but, but best original screenplay, yes, because she wrote a screenplay, uh, that felt like a movie that you knew, and then it very deliberately and angrily became a movie that you don't know. Uh, In exactly the same way that Get Out did. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Frankly, mm-hmm. and and I and that's why I've been saying all season that what Jordan Peele did with Get Out opened the door for someone like Emerald Fennel to do what she does in Promising Young Woman, which is to take genre material and elevate it into a in, into a different realm to use a genre what would otherwise just be a genre vehicle in this case basically spit on I spit on your grave mm-hmm. and and turn it into a vehicle for something that that has m- deeper characterizations more artistic filmmaking and to really sort of elevate it and you know you take a lowbrow vehicle and you turn it into a Rolls Royce and mm-hmm. that's what get out did and that's what this is also doing and uh for that level that reason alone you definitely want to listen to the commentary here. Uh, that's why I, I miss on on No Man Land. Uh, they have a commentary here. Uh, Emerald Fennel doing talking about the film and the origins. It's really really sharp. So we have not talked about Judas and the Black Messiah, which won uh, Best Sporting Actor for Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, it's it, it's it's so funny too because Daniel Kaluuya almost never uses his British accent. He's always playing Americans. So yeah. I think it really sh- it's a bit of a shock to the system when he goes out there and says, "Ah, you know, my mom, my dad." Uh, you know, they had sex and they had me. I, I love my life. Yeah, and he's got that, that South London yeah. working class bloke accent. It just kind of throws you for a second. But, sounds um, like, sound, sound like George Harrison. Uh, but, but I think <laughs> you, you have more reservations with Judas and the Black Messiah than I do. So, uh, um, your thoughts. Well, my reservations live in my reservations to have to do with biopics in the first place, which is, you know, anyone who's listened to Film Week or, you know, you know read my, my writing when it comes to, 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 to biopics understands that I have a real, um, a serious uh, set of problems with biopics to begin with. And, uh, usually because with biopics come uh, agendas. Uh, and they're either yeah. agendas in favor of or against, but uh, but there will simply always be an agenda uh, when there comes to a bio when it, when it comes to a biopic. Now you a lot, there are lots and lots of wonderful biopics. This is this is a well made film. It absolutely is really well made, really well well written script. Uh, you know, uh, Shaka King uh, the, 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 with the uh, directing well made film. But I, I look at this film, which purports to be about uh, Fred Hampton uh, and, and and all those figures around him, including. Uh, 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 a figure who sort William of O'Neill, who was the the Lakeith Stanfield character, but, yeah, yeah. All, all all purported to be actual people, uh, FBI agents, all of these things that that were going on. And this history, if you want to know this history, there's a wonderful documentary you can watch called Fred Hampton. <laughs> but if you want to, but, but 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 you will not find it in this movie. Uh, yeah. you, that, you, there are things that happen in reality that happen in this movie. That's not the same thing as history. Uh, and motivations ascribed True. to and purported to be and all, and all this kind of stuff, which, of course, you have to do in a narrative film, right? This is when we're making movies. Characters have to have motivations. and uh, All of that is just is just flat out gobbledygook uh, here. So wh- wh- when, when, when uh, you know, I look, I'm a historian as well as a film critic. Uh, you know, uh, yes, I'm a general historian. And I cannot tell you how many times over the course of my my, my work as a history teacher, I've had young students in front of me, high school, even young college students in front of me, and quote back the history of something that they got from a biopic. Yeah. 
uh, the film that they that's watched back, and they quoted back and at. That's a problem. And I, I even know, I even know the dialogue that they're quoting back at me because they think <laughs> that they've seen. Uh, I'm like, you know, no, stop. <laughs> that that is not. Yeah. It isn't. So that is the problem that I have with this very well made film. And of course, you. This is the odd thing about it. The better made the film, the bigger the problem. Because the more people, <laughs> it will bury yeah. itself into the zeitgeist as this true thing. Um, um, wonderful performances uh, in, in this film, but, but and then of course there's the question of this uh, this best supporting actor, best supporting yeah, well, actor, ah, whatever. Yeah, I mean that's that's where it gets really weird. Frankly, neither of them, and they were both nominated, Daniel Kaluuya and uh, Lakeith Stanfield. Supporting, but they're that. also both leads. Yeah, they were both nominated as supporting, but they both should have been nominated as leads. At least because they they are. They're co-leads. You know, as far as, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, so I, I, I think it's an incredibly well-made film. I think it's a touch too glossy, not as excessively glossy as the Chicago seven, which is way too glossy. Um, you know, it could have used a little bit more of that Serpico grit, that seventies era grit, that, that mm. grit that we got from, you know, Alan Pakula and Sidney Lumet. Um, it could have used a little bit more of that kind of grit, but nobody really puts that kind of grit into mainstream movies anymore. Uh, that being said, the nowadays totally when you do that, people think that you made a mistake that the filmmakers, yeah. because it's, it's not high definition. Is, yeah. All the small, the small axe films had that. Exactly. Steve McQueen Steve, made it. Steve you, McQueen brought it. Like you were watching a movie from the 1980s. That's it. Um, so this could have used a little bit more of that. But that said, uh, what really made this movie for me, Daniel Kaluuya is fine. I mean, he's fine. Fred Hampton is not so much a character as an icon in this film. Mm. I, I think mm. he sort of put a little bit too much on a pedestal. The real Fred Hampton was a was not exactly the greatest guy. He he became a martyr because he was killed. But he, yeah. you know, there are all kinds of dark edges to Fred Hampton that are that are that are problematic. But that being said, what I like in this movie are the gray areas, as I always do, the moral ambiguity, the, the, the internal struggles, which are present in two characters and a very interesting relationship. It's not the relationship between O'Neill and Hampton that is most interesting to me. It's the relationship between the FBI agent and O'Neill, mm. the FBI agent played by Jesse Plemons. That's what I find interesting. All those scenes with Jesse Plemons and Lakeith Stanfield, I think are great. They're amazing. They are just riveting because each of them wants something that they know they probably shouldn't be asking for. And there's a real, really a great moral quandary between the two. And I think that those scenes are incredibly well-written and well-directed. So uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, also with uh, Movies Anywhere Code. Not much by way of extras, just a couple of featurettes. Code. So that could also have used an audio commentary from Shaka King. I'd love to have heard from him. Tim, there is, as long as we're talking about film critics who are overexposed, especially you and Claudia, <laughs> let me just say, let me just say, by some stroke of great luck, the little things, mm. uh, Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, Jared Leto, a, uh, a Warner Brothers, uh, this went straight to uh, HBO Max. I think it may have shown up in a few theaters where theaters were open. This is a, a, a cop drama. You know, Denzel Washington is, a, is an aging cop who used to be a detective, gets sucked back into this this case and Rami Malek is the young cop who's, you know, a little bit too big for his britches and they've got to team up on this, this potential serial killer murder thing. And, you know, uh, it, it's a, it's a good gritty old fashioned cop yarn kind of goes a little bit off the rails at a certain point. Denzel Washington is phenomenal, but damn it. There's a featurette on here. that covers <laughs> all of Denzel Washington's old cop uh, uh, performances. Uh. You're interviewed on it. And yeah. you're really good. And Claudia <laughs> is interviewed on it, and she's really good. But there is this third guy that's just, he's Don't just a jerk. Don't he's just a it. scumbag. He's horrible. Do he's do dreadful. Like, he's ugly on the camera. What is his problem? Oh, stop it. You were fantastic. Yeah, you know, <laughs> And those the sort of wonderful, wonderful interviews uh, or uh, discussions that we had regarding those. What, what is it? Uh, um, um, I think we start with Ricochet. Yeah. Uh, Ricochet, Fallen, and Training Fallen. Day. Those, the, the, all four. Uh, uh, the, we have these sort of uh, in-depth conversations. Looking at Denzel Washington's sort of cop movie lineage is what we're doing. Yeah. And you're great uh, on, on all that stuff as well. We, and, all, we all raise really good points. I have to say that it's really fascinating. Watching, it's a, it's a good featurette. And we should tell everybody a little bit how this originated. So we were all contacted by the people at Warner Brothers about being interviewed for the featurette on this thing to tie together the cop lineage of Denzel Washington's films for Warner Brothers, which are those four films. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and 
Um, and this does kind of round it out. And it, and it's the point, one of the points I made was the only other person who has a, a canon of police performances with Warner Brothers is Clint Eastwood. And they're all variations on Dirty Harry. Whereas, you know, Denzel is doing a lot more here. You know, some of the characters are race specific, others aren't. Some of them are young and ambitious, others are old and used up. So, you know, in, in training day, he's a bad guy. In some of them, he's the hero. And some of them, like this one, is a little more moral ambiguity. So he's covering a, a lot of ground in what makes a law enforcement officer. So you and Claudia and I, we really had all these, but we were never able to get the interviews done the way they wanted to do them. Originally it was, okay, we'll be in a studio and we'll be yeah. really distanced. We'll have all the COVID protocols. And then next thing we know, uh, some, some kid in a mask is showing up at our doors, handing us a kit with a, with a, with an iPhone and a lighting scenario that we have to set up ourselves. And then that kid says, I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> and the kid runs off and, you know, and we, we get on the phone and do a Skype thing and set up the phone and do our, we, we basically lit and shot our own interviews. Yeah. It was a very bizarre, right? Yeah. It was and just the you know, oddest thing. You know what happened to Claudia? Do you know the story that happened to Claudia? I, th I think she did so, record something or it's like yeah. recorded the so, other direction or something. That's what it was because, because you're the, 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 the there was supposed to be, normally they would send you two cameras. Right. Or, or two phones that would go back to back so that, you know, you could you could look at one of them while the other one shot you or some. So I, I never quite understood how the two phones were supposed to work together. If it's one phone, you got to, you know, put it into the mode where it's shooting you. Mm -hmm. And Claudia wound up basically not doing that. And, and she shot like the mountains outside her window. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like this. It was like some sign of surreal Godardian thing. <laughs> so so she had to redo it. But uh, I found that very sweet and charming. I was wondering because when he said that to me, it was after this, he says, um, I, uh, you, uh, you can see yourself, right? And yeah. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, yeah I got to go, what, why did you ask me that? <laughs> but that was, that was funny. Uh, but so anyway, so there we are, right? Yeah, there we are again. And that's, and that has movies anywhere on it as well. But you want to get the Blu-ray. You really do because then you get to watch Tim and me and Claudia and have a lot of fun with it. Tim, did you ever get around to seeing Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar? Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. I think I did see that movie. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, that was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, uh Christian Wig and, and, and Jamie. Annie Mumolo. That was sort of a little wacky thing that popped oh. out. Right it's there, so nutty. It's just it's like so a, nutty. It's like a wacky Midwestern adventure movie, is what it is. I, I love a, you Kristen know Kristen when she does that kind of stuff. Kristen, Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumolo, her her longtime best friend and and co writer for Bridesmaids, and they go all the way back to the the Groundlings together. They apparently did these characters and did this routine when they were with the Groundlings, and uh, they are they are they, they've got a, a whole you know new movie that they're going to be doing. But I hope they do more of these Barb and Star movies. Um, it's basically like a female uh, Wayne's World or a female Strange Brew. Yeah. Um, they're just these two, these two, you know, Midwest uh, divorced ladies who just they, they they just ramble and they're just so charming and so eccentric and weird. And they wind up going on vacation to this place in Florida. And then there's this whole nutty backstory uh, or side story of uh, uh, this. You know, a, a crazed kind of Bond villain woman, also played by Kristen Wiig, who wants to wreak revenge on the very village, the very town that they go to on vacation. And uh, she sends her guy, uh, her, you know, uh, her, her her boyfriend, um, played by uh, Jamie. Uh, Jamie Dornan. Jamie Dornan. And, uh, you know, he winds up getting hooking up with Barb and Star and the whole thing. Look, it's just nutty. It's wacky. It's silly. It's completely off the off the rails. Uh, you know, it, it, there's just nothing about this thing that makes any sense. And yet it is endlessly funny and just superbly wacky. Um, I, 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 I just have so much fun. I've seen this thing six times and I sing along with all the songs and it's just it's completely wacky. I love it. Uh, Damon Wayans Jr. shows up in this thing too, who looks exactly like his dad. He's very, very funny in it. Um, it's uh, it's really worth checking out. I think I think it's a lot of fun. Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. You don't get a movies anywhere code, but you do get a whole bunch of special features and a digital copy, so you can uh, hook it up on your Vudu and watch it through Vudu. Um, there's a great audio commentary on here with uh, Josh Greenbaum, the director, along with uh, Annie and Kristen Wiig. And then, uh, you know, featurettes and bloopers and deleted scenes. The bloopers are hilarious. They are so <laughs> funny. I, I mean, you, you know, you make a movie like this, everyone's laughing anyway. It's an awful lot of fun. 
Uh, let's look at some other new movies we got here. Tim, did you see Breaking News in uh, Yuba County? Breaking News? I don't think I saw that one. What's on the... It's it it doesn't work quite so well. I wish it did. Um, this is a rather unfortunate movie. A lot of people who should be doing better work, to be honest. Um, it's it's kind of a social satire starring Allison Janney, and uh, it, it she's a woman who always wanted to be a television star. Her 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 unfaithful husband winds up dying while having sex with his mistress and rather than tell anyone, she hides the body and pretends that he's disappeared and and uses that ruse to turn herself into a media celebrity. Oh, there's uh, that Mila Kunis that's media that's celebrity. A, that thing with Mila, Mila Kunis and it, like yeah. a lot of people Mila Kunis. Wanda Mila Sykes Kunis is in it. it. Uh, it's all kinds of people. Juliet Lewis. Yeah, I mean Regina Hall. It, it, there, there are a lot of people in this thing, and uh, it just it should have been a better movie. Yeah, it really well, should have been a better you movie. Be Cliff Collins Jr. is in this thing. Get out of here. I know. It's just Ellen Barkin. It, it's in this not movie? Matthew Modine is in this movie. Come on. I man. know. I know. It's just not funny enough. It's not funny enough. But uh, I'm not going to tell it's people Tate, not Taylor. to get your house and Jane. No, Tate. That's Tate is um Tate is the uh that that movie about the maids. Uh, uh, yes, the, the the help. The help. It yeah. is the help. And and the thing is, the help. Even though I don't particularly like the help, I have all kinds of problems with it. Yeah. But the help is a very well crafted film, right? Yeah. It's well shot. It's well put together. This is not. This feels like they they made it for buck fifty and and shot it in two weeks. Um. Our Friend is a movie I would totally recommend. Uh, it's only on DVD. It is not on Blu-ray. I, I find that very unfortunate. Uh, this may be a sign of the time. This was this funded real, by this Universal. This is a really good movie. I remember when you reviewed this on, on, on Film Week. Really good film. It's a true story. Um, true story of, of a couple. Uh, the guy wrote the book that it's based on. Casey Affleck plays the guy. He's a very successful journalist. Dakota Johnson plays his wife. <clears throat> and when she comes down with cancer, they bring their best friend, played by Jason Siegel here, to sort of help hold their family together because they've got kids. And, you know, the, it, it's just it's too much stress fighting cancer and being an international journalist. And, you know, it just introduces too much baggage. And so they need this this figure, this friend to come in and help hold the family together. And it's um, it's really a profound story. Um, the book I've heard is amazing. I've never read the book, but it's it, it's really quite a profound movie. And Jason Siegel is so good. And I wish it was on Blu-ray. But it, it you know, funded by Universal, released by Gravitas Ventures during a pandemic year. I guess they just don't feel that they can get uh, get their money's worth out of a Blu-ray. But it is worth checking out. However, you get to see this film, Our Friend, really good. Jason Siegel, Dakota Johnson, Casey Affleck, very good movie. It, it gets um, itself drama and humor. Just right. Uh, it does. It really it's, does. It's, it's really, yeah, it's obviously very, very dramatic uh, movie, but there's, there's a certain humor that doesn't depend on jokes. Yeah. Uh, that's mostly about Jason Siegel. And um, yeah, love that. Who's kind of a loser. That's the thing. You know, he can't yeah. get anything right in his own life, but he comes and he makes their lives perfect. It's, it's about loyalty. You know, it's a movie about loyalty. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, really kind of a, a fun, dumb movie here. Uh, Psycho Gorman. Which is actually a family film, believe it or not. It, 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 I know with, with the title Gorman, you would think, what? It's about these two kids uh, who, for reasons I can't even, and methods I can't even get into, these two kids just make a terrible mistake and they bring back to life this this alien, this like alien demon, like Thanos type creature uh, many, many thousands and millions and trillions of years after he had already tried to, you know, do the Thanos thing. Like he was the Thanos of many, many eons ago and he wound up being frozen and they bring him, you know, kind of killed in a way. Anyway, they resurrect him. They bring him back to life. It's, it, it makes no sense. It's rather silly. Um, it's kind of like a really outrageous version of, uh, what was that? What was that dumb Pauly Shore movie with, uh, um, uh, in, in, Encino Man. Encino Man. It's like Encino Man, except with a with an evil <laughs> alien. Uh, That's what it is. It's like Encino Man with an evil alien and younger kids. Uh, but anyway, it's cute. It's got some fun stuff and fun commentary. A lot of uh, you know interviews with cast and crew and behind the scenes stuff. It's Psycho Gore Man. And uh, I, even though it's kind of a family film ish, uh, I I 
I don't like the tagline. He will bathe in your blood. It's not gonna make, <laughs> it's not gonna make parents comfortable. <laughs> like imagine kids are like, Dad, Mom, give me. He will bathe in your blood. Hell no, never. Uh, let's see what what other things we got here. Uh, you know, we got a little giveaway here. Oh. We'll do this one next. We're giving away three copies of Cosmo Ball. Send us an email to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. As long as it gets to us by uh, May 14th, we're good. And we'll send, we'll pick three people on that day and we'll send you a copy of the Blu-ray of Cosmo Ball. Uh, tagline here is the stakes have never been higher. It's a terrible tagline. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. Like um, this, this is crazy, a, crazy soccer thing, but uh, but only like you know, yeah, alien and it, super. What's that game that yeah, they played it, with that that thing in in, in the Harry Potter movies? <laughs> it's with it, oh, um, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, it's also a little bit like Space Jam. There's kind of a Space yeah, Jam yeah, quality yeah. to this as well. Um, it, it's you know, it, it's it's a post apocalyptic thing. Everything you know, intergalactic war has destroyed everything on Earth, and all that's left is this this crazy game called Cosmo Ball, which you know is is. I mean, it's it's like the ultimate post-apocalyptic sport. What can you say? And uh, that's and you know, it, it, it winds up becoming kind of a, a a thing for the future of humanity. So it's it's a it's a fun, cute, clever film. Probably would have gotten a theatrical release uh, in another year, but uh, otherwise, you know, we're we're happy to uh, to make Cosmo Ball available to three people. Just send us an email to godsdigigods.com or godsdcinegods.com by the fourteenth of May. Put Cosmo, Cosmo, just C O S M O, Cosmo in the subject line, name and address in the body of the email, and we'll pick three people by the fourteenth. Yeah. Um. Let's see what else we got here. Songbird. Oh, Michael Bay produced this. Um, <coughs> I that's set during I, the pandemic. Set during the pandemic, which is sort of a pandemic like anyway, a future pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I I really wanted to like this more. Um, I mean, it's got some good performances in it. Demi Moore shows up for a minute, and she's good. And Paul Walter Hauser, who I think is really becoming a fascinating actor ever since Clint Eastwood found him. Uh, Bradley Whitford, Sophia Carson, Craig Robinson. Yeah. You know, these are all really top notch actors. They yeah, all do really good work. Right. But I, I just, uh, you know, uh, it, it, I didn't need to sort of see like this, this is presumably takes place during a pandemic that goes on for years and years and years. And that's not really the kind of thing that you want to be watching right now. It doesn't really no. give you any light Thank at the end you. of the tunnel. It doesn't give you light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it creates this whole post-apocalyptic environment. There are these special zones, these quarantine zones, and you know the whole thing becomes very Mad Maxy at a certain point. And uh, I think we're, I think we kind of want to look past all of that. Um, one of these days, people may come back and revisit this and feel like it was, you know, when you don't have the pande- the actual pandemic going on. Like, you know, the, the, there's a reason why all the World War II movies that were made during World War II all were very optimistic. Like, yay, we're beating the Germans, we're beating the Japanese, we're we're going to win. Uh, this is a pandemic movie released during a pandemic in which there's just no hope, and yeah. that's a problem. Um, but you know, watch it your at your at your own risk. Your mileage <laughs> may vary. Uh, Rent a pal. With uh, Brian Landis Falcons and the great Will Will Wheaton from IFC Midnight. Will Wheaton yeah. doesn't look anything like he used to look on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Yeah, well, you know. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I should get some water and wet my palate here. Um, Rent a Pal is you know social media era uh, thriller that's a little bit too close to the bone, a little creepy. Um, the thing is, it's, it's set in 1990, so it backdates all of our current issues a little bit, uh, and tries to sort of look into the future of, you know, what we're going to be. So it sort of takes our current social media nightmare and gives it the veneer of late VHS era technology, if that makes any, any sense. Um, the, uh, the, there's this videotape called rent a pal and um, it winds up becoming kind of this artificial companion, like a digital bl- or a, a, an electronic blow up doll in a, in a sense. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a little creepy. It's a little excessively weird um, made for a minute for a buck and a half. So, I mean, I don't know. 
I, I don't know really what to make of the movie. I mean, it's 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 interesting. It's creepy. It's supposed to be, but I just didn't really enjoy watching it. Yeah. Um, few other things here. A few other new movies, and then we'll we'll kick over to some other stuff. Um, go this real quickly. Heartworn Highways. If anybody liked the original Heartworn Highways, there is now Heartworn Highways Revisited, which has uh, a lot of great uh, a lot of great you know folk and and music performances in it. Um, 45 years ago is when the original Heartworn Highways was, re- was, uh, released. So this is kind of a, uh, this is sort of a, a, a return to that moment to celebrate a lot of the music and the, uh, the, you know, the, the whole Nashville. It's a very, very particular scene in Nashville to celebrate the fact that it's still around. Yeah. And, uh, they went and they put together a lot of the people who were, you know, in the original film. And it's, uh, it's just really, you know, I mean, if, if you haven't seen the original, you should probably see the original first, but this is a, this is a nice revisitation and that's on Blu-ray. We also have a strange movie with Tom Green called Interviewing Monsters and Bigfoot. Uh, kind of sort of silly. I mean, Tom Green's, Tom, not really a, go together, yeah. Tom Green's not really a thing anymore, is he? He's no, sort of, not for a while. Yeah. Man. But, uh, you know, he's still making these little straight-to-video, straight-to-DVD things. And um, this is all, you know, kind of a, a comedy about, you know, Bigfoot and, and woodland creatures. It's got its, it's, got its moments, I guess. Uh, also shot for about a buck fifty. Not, not great. Not terrible. Um, let's see. We got The Penthouse. All the rest of these are on uh, – actually, there's one on Blu-ray. Let me take get the Blu-ray one out of here first. Uh, this the one other movie here on Blu-ray. The one other new movie is Doors, uh, which is a pretty good uh, lower budget genre movie. It's a little bit like Stargate with more cerebral qualities to it. This is from Epic. Um, it's about all these uh, these these like alien portals that start kind of appearing around the planet, and uh, you know all of these movies kind of always have like a bunch, usually a bunch of alien spaceships start appearing. And, and in this case, these are just portals and doors and people try to figure out what they are and um, where this goes is actually much more existential than it normally would be. It's you, you don't have like nine headed monsters pouring out. It actually kind of has a little bit of a Tarkovsky quality to it, which I appreciated. Uh, the rest of these are all DVD, the winter lake. Uh, this is also from Epic. This is a, um, probably would have been a CW movie once upon a time. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty decent kind of drama thriller, um, about troubled kids and, and, you know, living in the, living in kind of more rural parts of the country. Um, it's got some, got some good stuff in it. It's, uh, it's an Irish story. So, you know, uh, it, it it's like rural Ireland, Troubled kids, trying not to give too much stuff away here, but uh, you know it's it's worth um, it's worth a look. It's worth a look. Troubled kids are the same all over the world. Um, Tell my story from Cinema Libre is also about troubled kids. This is um, uh, about a a family that loses it. Well, uh, let's see. How do we not do this? Um, um, it's about a father's journey after family tragedy. That's probably a better way to put it. Um, about a father's journey after after family tragedy. Worth checking out. It's based around uh, some pretty horrible actual incidents. Um, there's a lot of actual. It's informed by real events. Let's let's put that. Let's put it that way. It's it's informed by real events and um, what it tells you about what's going on with kids and social media and everything else is very, very upsetting. Um, the penthouse with Nicholas Turturro and Michael Pere, neither of whom have been around for a very, very long time. This is a pretty uh, run of the mill thriller, um, kind of a, you know, revenge thriller, but it, 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 you know, this is one of those grindstone Lionsgate things. It's a programmer, um, fairly predictable, but pretty well done. Michael Pere is still a, an appealing actor. And then the last was called send it, uh, with Michael J white, Denise Richards, Claudia Lee, Kevin Quinn. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty good kind of, uh, extreme kite boarding, um, drama. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know anything about kite boarding. I know mm. a lot of people who I, I've seen people do it. Um, it's really more of a backdrop here just to kind of do this, uh, this kind of, uh, like, 
action drama comedy thing, but that's also a grindstone Lionsgate thing. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's again, also formulaic, also a programmer. Uh, Tim, what's, uh, what else, we, what else looks we, fun here? Can I, can I bounce around some of these mill creeks? Uh, a lot of classic yeah. films here that I really, yeah. really love, including, um, um, the pledge, <clears throat> of course, Sean Penn's, was it his directorial debut? I think it was. It was mind, not, it was no, the Indian second runner. film. Indian Runner, Indian Runner was the first one. That's right. Uh, uh, I love Pledge. the Pledge. Yeah, did you love both of those? It was a play, very powerful movie. Uh, Jack Nicholson, of course, uh, this cop, and uh, going to find pledges to find the killer of this this sort of young child and what it does to him. A lot of great uh, performances from fairly newcomers from back in that uh, that day. Patricia Clarkson, she had been around for a while. Benicio del Toro, of course, uh, um, uh, you hadn't been around all that long. Aaron Eckhart. Uh, it's just a really, really sort of powerful, powerful movie. Uh, uh, Sean Penn uh, uh, coming out of the gates there, like we said, Indian Runner. Uh, and this, um, uh, his sort of two top movies. I remember this being a very, a film that we were all talking about at the time. The Pledge. Do you remember it? Do, do you remember it much from back I remember it. I remember it so well. And I remember it, it just, it it had a, it just kind of got, it, it got in, it stuck in my, in my gut for a long time because he's the obsession of the character. You know, I like movies about obsession. Yeah. And, uh, and Jack Nicholson plays such a, a, a disturbingly obsessed figure in this thing. You know, I, I thought it was, I thought it was great. I thought it was really good. Really, really good movie. Um, And before, just before Dave Chappelle. I started doing the Dave Chappelle show uh, back in around 2005. He did this documentary called Dave Chappelle's Block Party. Uh, two, yeah, Shadow 2004 came out in 2005. And Michelle Gondry uh, directing Dave Chappelle's, which was a sort of recreation, kind of, of the wonderful uh, 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 the Watt Stacks, um, which was yeah. a documentary from 1973. These, I believe they were Swedish filmmakers. They came to the States back in 73, went down to Watts. I think you're right. And then yeah. they, they, they just doc this beautiful document documentary of music and this sort of like street party with all these concerts given by, um, you know, all of these iconic figures, even at the time, but certainly you know, the, Steve, the Stevie Wonders and all, all this kind of stuff. And Dave Chappelle sort of recreated this back in, uh, back in the summer of 2004. Uh, and made this movie, Dave Chappelle's uh, Black Party. And it, it really was sort of this precursor to what we, he would go on to do. On that, on, on that, on his television show, you know, the Dave, the yep. Dave Chappelle show, the sort of combination. It really, it, it, it really is particularly interesting that way, isn't it? it yeah. It, it, this is, this is sort of the beginnings of the Chappelle show. You can see the, the seeds. You know, and uh, wonderful, wonderful, um, um, uh, most of death, Yasmin Bay, I think it's what he goes by now, and Big Daddy Kang and Bilal and Lauren Hill from the, from the, from the, from the they, they were still called the Fugees, uh, way, way back then in common and just all of these young performers, Fred Hampton Jr., uh, interestingly. Uh, yeah, they, they are talking talking uh, at this thing. All of these sort of really wonderful performers, uh, you know, who over the last almost twenty years—not quite twenty years now—have um, uh, gone on to become very, very famous. So, yeah, uh, Dave Chappelle's Block Party, really, really sort of fantastic. Um, all the Pretty Horses, you know, uh, Billy underrated. Bob uh, you know, uh, it, 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 an, an, an interesting sort of reconceiving of all of that. I think uh, Matt Damon, Penelope Cruz, Henry Thomas. Um, yeah, I remember this. Is, this is two thousand. This is twenty one years ago. You know, yeah, uh, uh, that movie. And uh, you know, and there was a moment when 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 these films, these sort of adaptations of Cormac McCarthy, at which this is Tad Tally, I think, did the screenplay. Um, uh, they were, were were the thing. And I thought it was a lovely movie. It didn't sort of catch on at the time, but I thought it. I I, I it actually plays better now than it did then as it a does, sort of romantic agree. western drama. I agree. You know, anything on these? Any, any good, any, any, any good get? Not, not really. They're, they're all, they're all pretty, pretty bare bones. Uh, the, the three that I think are, are perhaps, uh, which are also bare bones, but, but the, the three that seem to sort of know what they are from the Mill Creek thing are the three that are being released, uh, with the, the whole retro VHS packaging, which is, uh, the dreadful stopper my mom will shoot with Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> oh, Stelgetti. I did the junket for that back in 92. Uh, my goodness, what, a, what an unfortunate <laughs> movie that is. Uh, the Babe, yeah. starring John Goodman as Babe Ruth, which has got all those biopic problems you're talking about. Mm. Those are it, It's got all of those in spades here. Uh, you know, Arthur Hiller, really at the tail end of his career, just giving it his all, but it, not, not to any great effort. And then the Oscar-nominated Gorillas in the Mist, yeah. in which uh, Sigourney Weaver plays Diane Fossey. 
And I think that's actually a better film uh, than a lot of people give it credit for. Michael Apta directed it. Uh, that was one of the uh, one of the earlier um, PG thirteen films that that didn't that didn't sort of feel exploitive of the PG thirteen. You know, usually PG thirteen is like, hey, it's it, it would be an R, but we took out some of the profanity and uh, and the blood, uh, but it still has all the violence. Mm. Um, this, Michael, this is PG thirteen. Didn't Michael die? We lost Michael, what, this year? Last year? This year? Michael Apted? He died. Uh, last year. Last, last year. Okay. Last year. I think it was last year. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I think I think Gorillas in the Mist is the one of these that you want to hang on to. Uh, Sigourney Weaver is very good in it. Uh, and it really does do do right by Diane Fossey's uh, legacy. I, th- I, I think this movie is also aged particularly well. Yeah. So that's also out from Mill Creek on Blu-ray. Uh, let's see. We got a got a few others here. Let's see real quickly. Um, Breach mm. uh, is not bad. That's uh, Chris Cooper and Laura Linney and Ryan okay. Felipe. Uh, that's a that it's it's not a perfect thriller. It's about the the the. It was at the time the greatest security breach in U.S. history. I think we've probably had many more since. Uh, it's yeah. kind of become a. It's kind of become a bad habit now. But at the time this film was made in two thousand six, it was. Um, and Dennis Haysbert's in this as well. He's very, very good. Uh, you know, this is kind of a, kind of a, a little bit Michael Aptity as well. Mm. Um, Snow White, A Tale of Terror, also with Sigourney Weaver and Sam Neill. Um, not the greatest revisionist retelling of Snow White, uh, but it's got moments. Sigourney Weaver is always worth watching, but I, I could do without this is from the late 90s. Sam Neill looks a little bit ridiculous. Uh, they're sort of trying to put a darker spin on Snow White. They were about oh, I remember films. that. Yes, yeah, it's a little little bit silly. And then uh, this has been out before, but we should just make quick mention. Rad, the um, the the BMX film, which is you know uh, presented by Jack Schwartzman and and directed by Hal Needham way back when. Um, the Rad is now out in this really cool uh, steelbook with a bunch of extras on it. So um, they did a 4K restoration from the original camera negative. And uh, anybody who bought this thing on its previous uh, Blu-ray incarnation will probably be really upset because there's a lot of fun stuff in this. I mean, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, still book. So uh, Mill Creek kind of went uh, above and beyond on this one. Uh, and if you like that whole, you know, the, the BMX legacy of this film, and it's you know it's 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 not a, it's not a bad movie. I mean you know Talia Shire and Ray Walston, Bart Connor, fresh off of winning uh, uh, a, a gold medal uh, in the Olympics, shows up here as well. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know this this movie has kind of a following, and it's really kind of the only film of its kind. So yeah, there it is. So we should also say that at the end of the show, we're going to have a very very special interview uh, that we are elated to have done. We're going to talk about the film in just a moment. But the great Belgian director, uh, Jaco van Dormael, sat down with us via Zoom. And we had a great, like, 34-minute interview with him. Um, Tim, that was, like, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was so so, so good. And, and <laughs> in a certain way, you know, you're talking to Jaco, it's like, it's like going to film school again, you know. Really course, and then he just has this sort of great history and perspective and and, uh, and particularly in the interviews that we did, he's, as he talked about his approach to cinema, which is very personal uh, and, and which he allows to be personal, uh, he, yep. he, he, he simply makes movies that, that he and, and he makes them in the way uh, that, that, such that they are, you know, coming from his perspective and, and saying things that he wants them to say and, and challenging uh, uh, ideas and whatnot, but they're very, very personal. And, and, uh, and he just simply allows that to be the thing. And it means he doesn't make a whole lot of movies. Um, yep. But every single one is very, very particular. Uh, and they, they're, they're Jocko films. They're just great. Uh, so before we get into that, I, I, I want to cover a few docs. We've got uh, four from Icarus and four from uh, First Run Features. Um, really, really good doc stuff here. You know, Icarus is one of the, the partner companies in uh, Ovid.tv, the streaming operation that has so many good independent and foreign films and docs. And uh, if you want to <clears throat> look at some of their better stuff on uh, on DVD. These four docs, you could do a lot worse. They are really, really great. Travels in the Congo uh, is especially timely right now. There's been a lot of horrible things happening in the Congo. And, you know, from colonial times to present day, the Congo has sort of been this nexus for a lot of really awful territorial fighting in uh, in Africa. 
And um, it's a it's a really, really beautiful part of the world that just is subject to so many horrible political uh, ins and outs. Uh, in any case, the, in this is set around the, the in 1925 when um, Marc Allegre accompanied André Gide mm. to what was then known as Equatorial um, uh it wasn't Equatorial Guinea. It was Equatorial something else. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, it, it eventually becomes known as the Congo. And um, the what they shot at the time was silent footage and kind of goes along with a lot of these other ethnographic films were made in kind of the mid to late silent period where people were seeing things around the world for the very, very first time. And so this is that footage with new score and brand, you know, newly digitized, uh, kind of giving immersing people in what the Congo was nearly a hundred years ago now, which is really, really fascinating. So, you know, if you if you if you follow events in Africa, it's this is one of the rare chances you get to sort of see what it was before it became what it is. Mm. Um, Marky in Milwaukee by a filmmaker named Matt Kliegman. This was, uh, kind of, this made the rounds at the, at the festivals for a minute back in, uh, 2019, a couple of years ago. Um, Marky Wenzel is a Baptist minister who, uh, at age 46 came out as transgender. And that sets into motion a whole lot of just crazy stuff in this thing that um, it will be extremely controversial given that that is a, a topic of conversation and in the news. So, you know, this is one of those stories that, that if, if you want fodder for the debate, it is worth adding to the, uh, to the, to the mix, the destruction of memory, the war against culture, the mm-hmm. battle to save it by documentarian, Tim Slade uh, looks at this unfortunate movement that we have all over the world now to try and erase uh, cultural heritage uh, all the way from, you know, the war in the Balkans into the Middle East to, you know, every other corner of the globe, how people are trying to basically eradicate what were once considered sacrosanct UNESCO World Heritage Sites and notably centering here around the city of Palmyra, which uh, was nearly destroyed by ISIS. So the destruction of memory, really, really interesting mm-hmm. talk about that. Uh, Softy, What Comes First, Family or Country by Sam Soko. <clears throat> also a very, very solid documentary. This was made just last year in Kenya. And uh, uh, it, it this is sort of looks back at the 2007 Kenyan elections and all of the, the, the upheaval that was centered around those elections, which was obviously not really covered here in the United States, but it's, uh, it's also a pretty, pretty significant event in, uh, in the history of modern Africa. Mm. So those 2007 Kenyan elections. And then, uh, first run features, we've got a belling cat truth in a post truth world, which is, uh, a little, seems a little bit conspiracy theory around the edges. Uh, this is looking at this group of online researchers known as belling cat, which, um, they, they, they kind of, they're the ones that sort of try to find the real stories behind the news stories and sort of pull the, the, the curtains back on a lot of these things that may or may not be what they appear to be. Um, uh, it's hard to know how much of this is, is legit and how much of it is, uh, is not, but, uh, it's a really interesting doc to watch mm. just the same. You can probably is. do with a lot more of that. Uh, you go to my head, Dimitri de Klerk. Uh, is the filmmaker. This is a um, uh, this is a drama, by the way. This is not a documentary, but it is yeah. from First Run Features. And, um, you know, uh, kind of a sort of an artsy Hitchcockian thriller set in the Sahara with these unusual enigmatic characters and, you know, mysterious things that have happened. And you have to sort of fill in the, the, the gaps. I guess if you think of if Tarkovsky had made uh, Vertigo in Africa, it would probably look something like You Go to My Head. Mm. Not thoroughly accessible, but some very, very good performances in it. And then the last two here, uh, this one is really, really great. A uh, French filmmaker named Alan Govenar made Myth of a Colorblind France which goes into the history of race relations in France, which I find interesting because, you know, I've, having lived there, um, you, there's sort of a, a, an idea that when a lot of black artists in America were rejected here, that they went to France mm. and found a welcome reception. Josephine Jazz artists. Josephine Baker. Josephine uh, Baker, right? Kelly Parker. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, even Gordon Parks, you know, went and had an, he was welcomed like a, like a king in France, mm-hmm. you know, his, his photography was celebrated and, uh, this, but this, it's not quite that. And this goes into that history and tries to find, you know, it's a, it's a lot trickier and more difficult than that, actually. Mm-hmm. And if you know anything about the history of France and their various, um, you know, colonial escapades, it's, it, it gets much more complicated. So a lot of great archival footage here, some really, really interesting interviews and uh, a very, very good film, re- well worth watching at uh, just 86 minutes. And then, um, for they know not what they do. This is a filmmaker named Daniel Carslake, who previously made a movie, movie called For the Bible Tells Me So. This is kind of a follow up to that. This has also won more than a few awards, uh, around. And, uh, this looks at, um, how do we even get into this? Uh, this, this looks at a, a, a lot of rather awkward sociopolitical Hmm. I'm trying to trying to put this in a way that doesn't sort of uh, reveal too much, but where religion and culture and race and nationality and gender politics all kind of overlap in the American heartland, uh, it's it's creating a lot of almost tribal conflicts, and um, this tries to sort of look underneath the surface and to see what is causing this, what can be done to remedy it. Uh, if anything, and um, I think it does a pretty good job. It's it's a little bit too short to really get too deep into it, but it at least is a good conversation starter. Mm. Uh, do we want to get into the arrow stuff or or hit off, hit the four K first? Uh, let's do some of the four K because I saw some of that business. Yeah, uh, so Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. You look uh, there. Yeah, you, you, one of the one of the one of the first uh, biggies to um uh, to come out. Uh, you know, in, in the midst of all of this. Uh, along with Mulan and, and, like I said before, Tenet. And it did well at the quote-unquote, uh, what are we calling it, the, the, the streaming office. You know, reports were that it, it, it was very popular, and, and, I, and, I, and I think we're calling it successful. But i got to tell you, I watched this movie, and it struck me as just a flaming mess <laughs> of an actual movie, you know, uh, in terms of what the story is trying to tell, this whole complicated yeah. thing that it's doing, uh, because you know uh, what's his name from the first movie is dead, but they got to have him in this movie, so they do this whole complicated yeah. thing where people see this guy, but he's actually that guy. And oh my gosh! And and and, and uh, you know, some of the fight sequences, the big, the bit sex, we're okay, but narratively, I do not see what so what this does whatsoever to sort of advance. And I suppose it was meant to be a standalone movie, but as a standalone movie, it's just a mess. And um uh, and and I hope that it has a whole lot of good stuff on that DVD. It 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 doesn't have enough good stuff. <laughs> it has, it does have you know movies anywhere, so you can add it to your library. But uh, otherwise, I mean, look, I like Kristen Wiig in this. I know nobody else did. They like she plays Cheetah. Cheetah. Who's she uh, playing? Huh? Who's she playing? Cheetah? Or the, 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 yeah, she plays Cheetah. Cheetah, yeah. Cheetah the 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 super villain Cheetah. Yeah. Um. Uh, and you know, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of, I, I understand what, I, I appreciate what they're trying to say about people and our wishes and how the things that we, you know, be careful what you wish for. It might be awful, but you know, not to give anything away here, the, the, there's a whole mystical backstory about, you know, things that fulfill your wishes and the world goes haywire. But at some point you cannot convince me that all 8 billion people on planet earth are such sociopaths. That there's not one person who would have the wish Please make all this stop. Yeah, exactly. Like, like why, it would only take one person to make that possible. Yeah. Just one person. Please make all this stop. And no one does. Yeah. Like, everybody wants their gold and their, you know, this and their that and their guns. And it, it, it's just, it, 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 it goes way off the rails. It basically says humanity is hopeless. And I, I just don't believe that. Uh, speed, Kingsglaive. I'm sorry. Oh, speed. Yeah, going to speed. Well, I was going to say real quickly, uh, Kingsglaive, Final Fantasy 15. If you can believe it, um, you know this is made for people who want to watch movies on their on their PS5. Uh, not much else. Final Fantasy should never have gotten to 15 movies that no one has ever heard of. Voices by Aaron Paul, Anna Hetty, <laughs> and uh, and Sean Bean. I, honestly, it's just you know what? It's just a Big, giant, violent, fantasy, sci-fi, monstery, sorty, medieval video game bunch of nonsense that makes absolutely no sense at all. I watched like 30 minutes of this thing. 
could not wrap my head around it. There's all there's a mythology here that just, you know, if you've seen the 14 other ones, knock yourself out. But I mean, this thing is just this is this is all this is is to show off. If you don't want to play like really, really high resolution video games on your PS4, you throw this in and it'll just rev up all of this, you know, 4K amazing uh, CG animation that just should not, never be folded into a story. Um, all right. Tim, speed. Well, oh. look, I, I, 1994 speed, Jan Dubon. Whatever happened to Jan Dubon? Uh, yeah, yeah, Graham Yost, original screenplay yeah. back when you could just write an original screenplay him and the Shane Blacks and the, and you know, all these guys sort of. Uh, look, this movie, uh, despite the fact that it is as old as it is, still plays for me as a wonderful, wonderful sort of love, love story action thriller uh, in the making. Dennis Hopper doing one of his classic evil bad guy characters. Uh, Pretty I, I, great. I, you look, yeah, I love Speed. Uh, so, so you know, what's going on? What's what, what, what did they give us with Speed? You know, uh, not not enough, but it's okay. Um, it's got it's got all the original stuff from the original Blu-ray and the extras. There's the Yandabond audio commentary. There's the uh, Graham Yost and Mark Gordon commentary, extended scenes, action sequences, and all you know the featurettes and whatnot. I mean, it's mostly stuff that we've all seen before. Um, you, you you know, it, it just happens that you get you do get the audio commentaries now on the. Uh, uh, on the 4K disc, not just the Blu-ray. All the other extras are on the Blu-ray. But um, no, I, I'll, I'll say this, and it comes with movies anywhere, but I will say this, the movie gets, has gotten better with time. I, I really hated this at the time when I saw it. I was just, you know, bitter, cynical, young film critic. But now it feels like, yeah, that's kind of a Hollywood classic oh, of its yeah. time, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and uh, it, look, uh, young uh, 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 Sandra Bullock, um, uh, it was just so cute that it's bananas. Uh, Keanu Reeves, uh, doing that thing that Keanu Reeves came to do so well. Um, yep. yeah, ex- that's exactly what it is. Just sort of like young Hollywood kind of thing. And I just, you know, still good. Uh, still good. What about Big Fish, Tim? Big Fish. I Big Fish is on 4K. for Big Fish. I just never cared for this movie. Uh, I, but you know, it, 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 it fell into the realm of one of those things that I appreciate more than I actually, actually love. Uh, but it might be one that grows on me after a few years, the older I get. Yeah. I, I, it's not as emotionally touching as I always wanted it to be. Uh, but I think Ewan McGregor is wonderful. Albert Finney is very good. Uh, also has, you know, Billy Crudup and Jessica Lang in it and, uh, Marion Cotillard and Robert Guillaume, Helen Bonham Carter, mm. you know, great Danny Elfman score. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty solid John August script. It just yeah. doesn't all quite gel. The way that it should. Um, also, movies anywhere code here, but um, in 4K, it is absolutely beautiful. I will say that it looks better than it did to, uh, when it was projected. So, if nothing else, all of Tim Burton's, you know, visual stuff comes through. It just, I wished, I wanted a, a better overall movie. Um, also on 4K from Severin, who has never released 4Ks before. Severin's released a couple of films from uh, cult filmmaker Alex de la Iglesia. Um, <coughs> excuse me, The Day of the Beast is one, and Perdita Durango is the other. Perdita Durango is the one that I really, really think everybody should pay attention to. That was made in 1997. Rosie Perez uh, and Javier Bardem, uh, absolutely terrific. And Demian Bashir is also in this. Yeah. Plays a loan shark before anybody knew who he was here. But um, really a great cult film. You know, uh, Rosie Perez has to, uh, she goes to Mexico to, to, to basically scatter her sister's ashes and uh, winds up falling in with these just horrible people, starting with, you know, uh, Javier Bardem, who's, you know, a, a, a drug dealer. And Demian Bashir is this this uh, loan shark. And um, it winds up getting really pretty nasty before it actually starts to get a little bit redemptive. And it, and it winds up coming back to Las Vegas. But it's it's quite a trip. It's quite a trip. And, uh, and, you know, Day of the Beast is not quite as good, but it's, uh, it's got also, it, it, you know, it has its moments. Not, not really, uh, that kind of a high profile cast, but, you know, if you like Delay Iglesia and you like his, his particular style of, uh, culty filmmaking and a little bit more of a supernatural thing going on Day of the Beast, it's not yeah. just a straight up crime film. Dan- but, dance, you know, Delay Iglesia, dance, he's a good. I'm sorry, Dance yeah. with the Devil, right? That other one was called uh, Dance with the Devil in, in, in the. Perdita space. Durango, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and, okay. da- and Day of the, and Day of the Beast is, uh, you know, more kind of uh, Rosemary's Baby-ish type yeah. stuff. But Dele Iglesia has a certain style. And uh, good on Severin for, for deciding to give him the, uh, the 4K treatment. 
Um, let's, you know what, let's, let's, let me hit a, a couple of criterion, just to n- go through these criterions real fast. And then we'll go down the arrows and we'll wind up with, uh, Toto the hero okay. before we dovetail into, uh, into Mr. Van Dormail. Um, criterion has given us just a, a bunch in the weeks that we've been off, uh, a whole bunch of great stuff. Jean-Luc Godard's masculin feminin is out, uh, on Blu-ray. Um, not one of my favorite films, but if you're a Godard film, it's essential. It has a uh, uh, really uh, rare stuff in it I'd never seen before, which is footage from a Swedish uh, television program of Godard uh, directing uh, part of this film, which is pretty pretty cool. Um, the wonderful Defending Your Life, Albert Brooks, director approved version. I mean, you know, Meryl Streep what is just divine say? in this thing. Yeah. It's just a beautiful movie. Defending Your Life, one of the best things Albert Brooks ever did. Certainly one of the most charming things that uh, Meryl Streep's ever been in. It's just a um, classic over the years. Oh, it's so good. Uh, another director approved uh, edition is Secrets and Lies by Mike Lee. Mm which is just this amazing movie that introduced the world for the most part to uh, Marianne Jean-Baptiste and Brenda Blethyn. They are both extraordinary in this. Um, You know, this is all about kind of family and what makes family and search for, you know, an adoptive birth mother and, uh, you know, so many interesting twists to this. Uh, this film wound up getting many Oscar nominations. Brenda Blethyn won uh, Best Actress at Cannes for this. Yeah. Really a superb film from 1996. Can't believe that was 25 years ago. Wow. 10, 25 years ago, Secrets and Lies. Oh, it burns. We are it ancient. burns. Oh. Anthony Mann's The Furies, an absolutely superb, brilliant, extraordinary Western um, with Barbara Stanwyck and Walter Houston from 1950, one of the last great you know, major black and white Westerns uh, before we get into the big widescreen Western period of the late fifties. A um, lot of fantastic biddies on, on here. There's a, there's a booklet that comes with this too. Uh, basically the entire actual Niven Bush novel in, in booklet form combined with the Blu-ray. So you, you know, they, I, I don't, I didn't even know there was a novel that this thing was based on, but it's here. Uh, Bong Joon-ho before he made Parasite made this, amazing uh, uh, police procedural, which got released after Parasite this last year. It's called Memories of Murder. Mm. And it's great. I mean, it's really, really great. It uh, it also stars um, uh, Kim Sang-kyung, who is the star of Parasite, the father in Parasite. He's the detective here who has to try to solve this crime, which is based on an actual crime which was not solved until many years after the movie was made. The movie was made in 2003, finally released here last year. And then I think it was last year that they actually found, they solved the crime and figured out who the, who the, the culprit was. Um, so it, it, it's crazy. Um, there's a documentary on the making of the film from 2004. There's a whole lot of other really, really cool stuff on this. It's an amazing film. It's kind of in the vein of seven if you need a, a comparison, uh, Olivier Assayas, the French director, was once married to the extraordinary Maggie Chung, famous uh, Hong Kong star, and uh, they made a movie together that's totally weird. It's called Irma Vep from uh, 1996. Yeah, it's cool. It's weird. It's kind of a little bit French, a little bit Hong Kong, and a lot of neither. And uh, the whole idea here is it's kind of a film within a film doing a remake of Louis Foyad's uh, Les Vampires with a kind of a modern kind of Franco-Asian twist. The whole movie is really a trip. It's just a husband and wife trying to do something that's a little bit too meta, but winds up being really kind of cool. It was kind of a cult uh, classic. It became one anyway. It, yeah, it became a cult classic. So that is also a, a director approved Blu-ray. And then uh, my favorite of the new Criterions is History is Made at Night, one of these wonderful, wonderful movies from the 1930s by Frank Borzaghi. Uh, it, they, this is just one of those fantastic, classic golden era movies. Doesn't over, overstay its welcome. Gene Arthur, Charles Boyer, you know, this is this is just absolutely wonderful Hollywood filmmaking Um uh, you know, romantic chemistry, great writing, lots of snappy one-liners. Um, it, it's got a little bit of a dark edge to it as well, a little bit of melodrama, a little bit of noir, uh, a little bit of romantic comedy, a little bit of screwball comedy. It's kind of wraps it all together in this really, really smart movie. And Gene Arthur and Charles Boyer have never been better. History is Made at Night by Frank Borzaghi from 1937. So those are our criterions. 
And now let's get into the uh, some of these arrows, and we'll we'll wrap out on on Toto. Um, any of the, any of these arrows that you wanna you wanna make mention of other than Toto, Tim? Well, uh, others, that, others we can push off to the future week if needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll 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 get to that. That Mary Milligan collection. Mary yeah. Milligan was sort of a strip a strip tease artist and model yeah. and whatever and she did this whole sort of uh collection a whole bunch of these sort of strip tease uh, uh movies come play with me in the birds all this kind of stuff what's in this collection that i see you have it's ridiculous here? so it's got come play with me from 1977 the playbirds confessions uh from the david galaxy affair queen of the blues mary millington's true blue confessions and respectable uh, and then there's also a documentary from 2015 called The Mary Millington Story, which is all about her her life. But basically, she, you know, in about five years, she made six kind of strip teasy straight to VHS movies in the yeah. early rental period. Uh, very titillating for, you know, young teens who might not be able to sort of scratch that itch in a different way. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it really is very much a movie of that Scream Queen moment. Uh, it, it's a... It really is a, a weird flash of the pan. I had never heard of her at the time, to be honest. This is, I mean, I, I was like, really? This was a thing? Yeah. You know? Yeah, it was weird. Weird yeah, to California. discover that. Uh, 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 lovely, uh, what's, what's her name? Page. Something Page of her period. Um, uh, oh, the, the Betty Page. Betty Page of her period. Yeah. Kind, of a, kind of a Betty. Yeah, but a little bit of a Betty Page throwback. Uh, uh, the uh, Invisible Switch Man appears in 1949. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. I think this is better than the original uh, Invisible Man, to be yeah, honest. It's, 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 well, it's the same kind of stuff is going on, only it's all Japanese. Yeah, it's great. It's 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 really really a a, a terrific kind of Jap exploitation is what they called this particular moment. But it is kind of a a cool Jap exploitation uh, variation on the the whole Invisible Man uh, phenomenon. But the special effects are great. I mean, it really does a very very cool job of. Um, of, of reinventing the story in uh, in as kind of a Japanese um, uh, cult story, I, I, it's very very cool. The Invisible Man appears. That's uh, that's on Blu-ray. It has tons of great extras on it. Um, and there's also a second film on this thing too, which is The Invisible Man versus the Human Fly. Oh, which would never be there. Uh, no. and you would never release that as its own movie. But it's a it's a fun bonus. Um, you know what else is all, also worth mentioning is Jack Hill's Switchblade Sisters, which oh, was released yeah. theatrically with Quentin Tarantino sponsoring the release uh, some years ago. Um, this is just a straight up, you know, uh, feminist uh, street fighting exploitation film. Jack Hill only made these kinds of things, did a lot of uh, black exploitation stuff, did a lot of kind of uh, soft Corey stuff. I mean, he was a he was a fixture of the period. And Switchblade Sisters, for some crazy reason, is the one that uh, that he seems to be most remembered for. Uh, there's a new audio commentary on here with Sam Dayan and Kat Ellinger, which is very, very good. And uh, a great archival documentary uh, featuring, you know, Jack Hill and some of his collaborators called We Are the Jezebels. And, you know, I mean, it, really, it's a it's an it's an iconic film of its day. It's not a good film, no, but no, it's no. kind of a it's kind of a funny film and uh, it's memorable for a lot of sort of odd reasons um any others in here that look particularly good Ooh, is, is southland tales that richard kelly film with uh yeah, it sure with, is with, yep. with the rock when he was we still yep. like he's dwayne johnson now yes but back when he made this thing back in 2000 whatever it was uh 2006 yep. or so he was he was the rock he still had hair uh, and sean and richard and richard kelly still had a career and richard kelly has still had a career so you know yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of kind of this yeah you directed and, and wrote this another one of those original screenplay movies you can still yep. get away with that back in the day uh and it's just this wacky wacky movie with uh with the wayne johnson and sean william scott and uh sarah michelle galar who had played buffy the vampire slayer of course you know on on television's buffy the vampire player and you know, porn star and a conspiracy and a and the whole wacky thing. I don't know. I remember this movie being not particularly good, but as it's I as mess. I look at it now with all of these people in it who I really really like a lot and was nuts about them, I, I'm, I'm thinking so I wouldn't mind watching this goofy ass movie just to see what happens. You know, it's funny. It, he made he made Donnie Darko, and that's one of those flash in the pan movies. And yeah. Donnie Darko, for some reason, made everybody think that this guy was like the he, he was gold, and he was able to do anything he wanted for his next film. You couldn't do this today. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> but he 
He followed up Donnie Darko with this thing, which was just a, a mess. It was just yeah. an indulgent Long, mess. But, two hours and a half, something nuts. Oh, but you know what? It's just one of those, like, uh, I mean, it, it, there's nothing like it. There's nothing else like it. I, it. It's Even though it's a mess, it's kind of a spectacular mess in a way. And you look at it now in hindsight and you're like, how did that ever even get made? Um, tons of extras on here, including uh, It's a Madcap World, The Making of an Unfinished Film, which is this, uh, which goes into depth of everything on this thing that that went wrong and some of what what went right. But mm. boy, what a what a what a wild blast from the past! And it's, well, uh, man, Rich, it's weird the last to thing he did was The Box, two thousand nine, Cameron Diaz. I know James Marsden, that Frank Langella thing. It's kind of a creepy little film that you know the couple gets the box, and what's in the box, and all that kind of stuff like that. But yeah, even yeah, that yeah. that's more than de- that's uh, that's uh, more than a decade ago for him. So you know, well. Here's the here's the film we're going to wrap out on today, and we're going to dovetail right into our interview with uh, with with Jaco Van Dormel, uh, Toto the Hero. Now, this is the thing about Toto the Hero. Toto the Hero was um, it, it's been one of those. You know, we used to do this bit on uh, why the hell isn't it on DVD years ago when when I did the show with Mark, and we did a few of those, and then it just got to be too unwieldy of a of a, of a list. But the one film that was always sort of at the at the top for me was 1991's Toto the Hero. Mm-hmm. Because it's never been on on VHS, it's never been on DVD, it's never been on Blu-ray. This has never existed in any form whatsoever. I was not able to see this film again until recently, almost thirty years after the fact. Yeah. This is a film that came out when Tim, when we were just starting out. Yeah, and um, it is an amazing film. This is Van Dormel's debut film, and it is extraordinary. And he's only made a few films, and we talked to him about that, and we'll we'll get into you know how how uh, infrequently he actually makes movies, but. It was incredibly ambitious. He didn't decide, oh, I'm going to make an action film or a romance or something that'll sort of get me, get, get my footing. No, he made a movie that is nonlinear, that, that starts with this old man and jumps back and forth in time, covering his life and his rivalry with this other kid who may or may not actually have existed mm. and scenes of memories that may or may not even be accurate. I mean, the whole thing is like this poetic mist it just sort of sweeps through and you know it's 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 not clear what's real and what isn't and it's it's just a fascinating film and i think the most fascinating thing to come out of our 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 interview with him is that that he didn't make this in the editing it actually was scripted like yeah 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 because it was a part of a thought process and and ideas that were floating around in his head in this sort of particular way so we just sort of like shoot what was in his uh, head? He wrote what was in his head, and 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 the way that it would, it came out of his head, and 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 then it sort of came together as as this film. And, and what's central to the film are the questions uh, that that, yeah. that, are, that are being posed, because these are just sort of the questions, you know. And, and as we look back over our lives, and and we sort of justify and and, uh, and and move things around, and memory gets tricky. And and what and, and what I love about this movie is which nineteen ninety ninety one movie. What he's talking about in this movie, particularly the stuff that has to do with the way we remember things or fail to remember things or mm. screw up the things that we, at, at, you know, from, from this perch in 2021, I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, whatever it is you think you remember, yeah. <laughs> don't concern yourself with it. <laughs> it's just, it's- you know, remember it the way you want to remember it. It is a beautiful film. It is a, d- a deep film. It won him the uh, Camera d'Or for Best First Film at the Cannes Film Festival and also won Best Foreign Film at the French César Awards because mm-hmm. Jaco is, of course, Belge. He is not French. Mm-hmm. So we need to give him his due there. Uh, but, yeah, what a wonderful movie from Arrow Academy and uh, courtesy of our good friend Ray Green, who has interviewed uh, uh, Jaco in his class. He enabled us to uh, do a Zoom with Jaco uh, all the way on the other side of the globe, uh, from from uh, two of us here and and he in Belgium, and we made it work. And uh, without further ado, here is our conversation with the great Belgian filmmaker Jaco van Dormel. All right, this is an unbelievably special opportunity. Uh, Tim and I have the supreme honor of talking to uh, Jaco van Dormel the great Belgian director of, of four remarkable movies over the past 30 years. We're going to get into why only four movies in 30 years, but they are all great. And that's one thing that is so impressive about, about the filmography. But specifically, this is an amazing opportunity. Toto the Hero 
from 1991, Jacques Van Dormel's directing debut, one of the great films of the past 30 years. Tim and I were just starting out in this business at the time. And um, uh, Toto was a revelation to me, especially considering it was a first film. I mean, this is an unbelievably ambitious story to tell as a first film. I'm going to give a quick summation of it, and then I will let Jaco take over. This is basically a movie about an old man looking back on his life and the rivalry that he had with another kid. And at a certain point, you begin to wonder what is real, what is not real. And then you realize it doesn't really matter. He may not be remembering anything correctly. He may be remembering some things correctly. And you're just along for the ride in this incredible nonlinear jumping through time, crisscrossing characters and fantasy ideas. And it, and it becomes sort of an existential tribute to life. A a am I overstating the point? Uh, and did I explain it correctly? Thank you. Thank you. No, it's always great to, to have a description because I, I never know really what I've done. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to hear. Yeah, it was, it, it was a, it was a first film. So first film is always something strange. It's like, uh, it's like the country where you are born, you know, you start from the first film and then you walk down. So, so I was very, it, it was a, the writing was very long, like all of my films, probably because the writing is is the most important uh, uh, um, for me. Uh, I've, it's it's four stories that are mixed: the 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 the, the childhood, the adult, and the, the old man and the dream. And um, uh, at the moment, I was uh, when when I was. Something like 23, I started with, with the story of the kids. Then I started later with the story of an old man, then later with the third story. And at the moment, I, I could combine all these periods of time because the most interesting was the holes between uh, these characters, the fact that as an adult, he doesn't resemble at all at the, the, the kid he was, and the old man does, doesn't resemble at all at the adult he was. And um, so it's more of the, 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 the big holes in, the, in his life. And uh, so at that moment, I, I understood, okay, then I, probably I, 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 have the, I have the storyline. So I, I wrote from when I was 23 until I was uh, uh, 29. So wow. it's, uh, it was, yeah, it's always a long process. Um, but it's, it's the most, it's the most, uh, it's the most interesting. And at that time, people said to me, it's very complicated. And the film is so quick and so fast, you know. And when I see it now, it's, um, it's not complicated at all for the modern audience, and and it's nearly slow for, compared to other films. So um, I think the language changed, and also what was interesting is the the fact that, as you said, you don't you don't know what happened. You know, it's it's more it's not filming r the reality; it's more film filming. What, what, what I like is when the cinema works like the brain, you know, and can jump from one moment to another, from one space to another, from one time to another, with, with the same freedom as as the as literature. And um, that 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 was the most uh, yeah fun to to write to combine something that exists only in the mind of the character, you know, like, uh, like when you remember something, like um, uh, when, when everything is sometimes very clear and confused, and also when the brain is trying to, fi to find a meaning in something that perhaps doesn't mean anything. How close is the final film to what you wrote? It's, it's really the same thing. Um, it's it's 
it's the inside of the scenes that uh, is that where the editing was very important to have the good rhythm but the order of the scenes is the same as the as the script and as the, the drawings that I did from the beginning to the end of of the scenes and um yeah and after that you know the, the, I was very lucky because people went to see it you know it's it's uh, I, I wanted to ask because because your very yes, first yes. films were, were documentaries, and I was wondering how documentaries uh, inform the rest of your filmmaking. Oh, I was I'm a very, I'm, I'm very bad in documentaries. I tried, but it's always difficult not to find a meaning where you don't when you are not sure that there is a meaning, you know. And that's also the, 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 the that was also the subject, one of the subjects of Toto the Hero, you know, the guy tries to make with his life a story. And um, probably it's, it was just a life, you know. And he, he, he ordered some scenes for, he ordered scenes for one hour and a half, in his memory, just to give the meaning that he was the victim and the other bad guy, Alfred, was the bad guy. And at the end, he realized, okay, perhaps uh, was I the bad guy? You know, <laughs> Alfred was the victim. You know, and that's the sort of process to uncertitude. But the way the brain works to find meanings is something very close to to the cinema, uh, the, I, I see that in my own life, meaning is not very clear and I make, and, and my favorite medium that is cinema uh, is, is very meaningful. You know, every scene has to be indispensable. Everything that happens must have a reason and the end will give a meaning to everything that precedes. And the, and the strange experience of being alive uh, that, that this character has. Um, the most beautiful scenes are not the most indispensable. Uh, the causes and consequences are not clear. And the end doesn't give a meaning to everything that precedes. So what he does, uh, Michel Bouquet, in, in, in the film is, yeah, trying to control his own death because all the rest he didn't control. You know? Oh, that's amazing. You know, Tim and I, we often talk about the, uh, the difficulty of getting movies funded in Hollywood. Everyone likes to always say, well, Hollywood is the movie capital of the world, but you know, it's, it's also enormously pressurized by economic considerations and by marketing considerations and the politics of it. And it, it just strikes me that, you know, you look at, you made your debut film with something you took six years, seven years to write that is completely unconventional and very personal. And in the end, a little bit ambiguous. Um, something like that could never be funded as a, as a debut film here. How did you, I mean, how did you even go about dreaming that you could get this funded as your as your first foray into directing. I mean, what kind of pushback did you face? Yeah, I think I, I think to be a director, you need to be very optimistic and very stupid too. And probably <laughs> very stupid is the most important quality. Yeah, and not realizing that it will not work. You know, not realizing that you will have to wait for years uh, to, 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 be, to be on a set uh, and always thinking, oh, it will work and it will be a good film and people are going to see it, you know. And all these things make that, you know, if uh, I continue to be stupid enough to think, okay, it will be good, it will be good. And especially in the, in the process of writing where... 90% of the, of the time, the script is about script. You know, otherwise, it wouldn't be so long. Right. Uh, it's 90% uh, of the time when I write, 
I say, okay, it's not that, you know, it's not that, it's not uh, how, how to make it work. And, and it's like taking every morning a chewing gum, the same chewing gum and trying to find the taste of the cherry again and try and try to remember the taste of the cherry if you don't really have it in the mouth. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, I think no script writer thinks he's a genius because the, the, the ordinary life of a script writer is to be a bad script writer until the end when, when, when he finds the way out, you know. And, uh, but uh, it's so long to be lost in a story before to be able to, mm. you have to build it. But for me, anyway, I have friends who can write a script in, 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 in two months and I, w- I would like, I, uh, I would like to be able to do that, but, um, it takes, it takes time. It takes so much time. Yeah, I had a very good teacher, Frank Daniel. It's interesting. He was a teacher in, in LA and in New York. And he said, yeah, Frank Daniel, he came from Prague and he was in, in Brussels. He was my um, teacher for script writing. And he said, uh, if you look at the pants of a script writer, you know, if they are very flat behind, it's a very good script writer because he has to sit for at least three hours a day, you know. <laughs> so that was, it was, yeah, and, and so I try to sit down three hours a day. Tim, you, you had a question. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Wade talked about yeah, Tim, uh, how question? difficult uh, it, it would be to, to, to make this film. But it seems to me that with streaming services like Netflix and whatnot now, Perhaps a film like Toto would be fairly easy to get made, relatively speaking, but um, that's where it would live as opposed to in, the, in a thre- theatrical sort of situation. Uh, but I don't know, perhaps more people would see it that way. What, how do you find the filmmaking environment now with streaming services and whatnot? Is it more receptive to uh, interesting ideas? It's very deserved, but there is a big diversity, I think. But it's it's really a stream, you know. It's a, when when I when I started, there were not so many films. There were not so many uh, platforms and things like that, you know. Um, and so I realized there are more and more difficult, more and more possible ways to, to make different films. I try to learn, you know, I try to learn to be, to, to make it like the, like the kids with less money, less time. Um, but it's always, you know, it's always, uh, such a strange experience. You, you have to be lucky. It's like making a film is like dropping, a message in a bottle in the sea, you know, you never know if somebody will see it or if somebody will find the bottle on the, in the sand, you know, most of the time it's lost in the sea. And when somebody finds the bottle, it's a miracle, you know, and when somebody sees the film you've done, it's a miracle. It's incredible when, the, when there is audience sitting in a the theater or, or people looking at it uh, at home, it's, it's a miracle to, to arrive there. Well, it, it, this is this is very much like that because, as I'm sure you know, this is never Toto has never been available on DVD or on Blu-ray in 30 years. And it, you know, we used to do a segment on this show called "Why the Hell Isn't It on DVD," where we would go down every few years a list of movies that are, are like these are great movies. Why are these not? And Toto was one of those that just kept coming back again and again and again and again. And, and I won't get into whatever reasons why, but we're just grateful that it is here. But what's, here's what uh, another thing we were talking about, too, you know, uh, with Zack Snyder's uh, Justice League getting the, the IMAX aspect ratio. Uh, and you've released this in the original 166 ratio, which is, is more of a full frame than I remember seeing it projected. 
So on top of everything else, um, why was it shot 166? Oh, at that moment, it was natural. Hmm. No, it was like, uh, like, like, like the format of the TV now, you know, it's 166 was something that was very not, not well for, for, uh, landscapes, but interesting for, for faces, uh, it gives, uh, the, the, the way you use the camera, of course, is, is different. After that, I, I went more and more to scope and wider screens. And um, I know the young generation is more and more square. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it depends on, you know, in, in painting, they used, they used uh, during the centuries uh, formats that are more close to the portrait. Uh, close to a portrait of two people or close to a landscape, you know, and, and, and it made these different formats of the paintings. And, and here it's more, it's more technical here, of course. We started with, start with a 35 millimeter, um, four little pins in it, and then it gave uh, the, it gave the format. And, uh, and so, 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 but the 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 the, the, process, the, the way the eye works into the images of course very different in one sixty six and or, or in, in in two in two forty, uh, and now for the moment I'm more for for my last films I was more wide, even in close ups. Uh, I don't think I would go back to 166 because it, it, in 166 I have more the feeling that I would may make more shots uh, and in, in something more wide I can combine easier backgrounds and forward and foregrounds. But it's, yeah, it's always, at the moment it's a choice, huh? you do it like that and and, and after that, you are married with it, you know, for the whole film. And you have to make it beautiful. Let's, let's move to, to some of the other films in your filmography, because you've made four films in 30 years, which is one of those, you know, the, we, we think of people like uh, Andrei Tarkovsky or Jean-Paul Rapneau or uh, Stanley Kubrick, who they space it out. They only make a movie when they know they can make it great. And your films have all been great. I... <laughs> I did the press tour for um, The Eighth Day uh, here, it, which, which you made five years after Toto. And I, I interviewed uh, both Daniel Otoy and Pascal Duquesne, who, who won jointly Best Actor at that year's Cannes Film Festival. And um, it really, the interview just turned into a, into a, love, a love fest for you, um, which isn't often the case with actors, but they genuinely adored making that film with you. And since then, you then you waited 13 years to make Mr. Nobody. Everybody wondered what, what had happened to you. And Mr. Nobody is an amazing film. And then the brand new Testament just a few years ago is also amazing. You work infrequently, but your films are all really, really great. Um, so what, you know, what drives you? When does the when does the pressure build up so greatly that, you know, you have to make the film? I, I never know. I never know. Um, uh, I never know why do I think that a script is finished? I never know if it's because it's good or because I've write, I've written it for too long, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, but it, it takes time, huh? It takes time when my, when I will make, uh, uh, I will show my films to my grandchildren. It will take a little afternoon. And they will tell me, they will ask me, what, what else did you do, grandpa? And I would say nothing, nothing, uh, because it, yeah, it takes time. It really takes time to, uh, for me to find, to find the thing that I, I really want to do. And, um, when I made short films before, sometimes I was shooting too fast, you know, and when the script is not good, 
being on the set is a nightmare. And when a script is good, being in, being in a, on, a, on, on the set is, is a party. You know, it's fun. It's easy. Uh, there is no question. Everything is so simple. And then, it, th th then shooting becomes a fantastically, fantastically nice experience and warm experience because, because you go to, from something where that you wrote most of the time alone and, and then it becomes a sort of collective piece of art where everybody changes something, where everybody brings some complexity when the actor is in flesh and bones instead of being a sort of ghost. And, and when I write, I, for, for years, I, I talk with ghosts, you know. Uh, the character talks to me, I hear them, I take notes from what they say, and suddenly when, a when, when an actor or an actress came in and becomes this character, it's very moving. And then the cameraman, when he takes, uh, when he makes, puts a lens that is a 35, but not a 50, it changes the whole thing. And when, uh, when the, the set designer put that color and uh, it changed everything and the light changed everything and the camera changed everything and the music changed everything and this, or the sound designer does change everything. And so then it becomes really a piece of art, you know. Uh, a collective piece of art, it becomes something that uh, it's much better than uh, anything I could have done alone. And of course, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be on a set and realizing, wow, it's much better. <laughs> then, uh, but, but the script has, has, to be, has to be good. But a painter, a painter can, say, can sign a painting and say, okay, I was... I did it, uh, and a writer can sign a book and say, okay, it's, I, w I wrote it, but a director cannot, I mean, must, we, sign, we sign a film, but for sure we were not alone at all, you know. Everybody was, everybody brought, brought something that was, uh, that makes the thing complex and much more and impossible to imagine with all this complexity. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing. Our, uh, so our colleague, Ray Green, who was kind enough to, to arrange for this, um, he, he said when he interviewed you that you said you would make a Marvel film in a heartbeat. And I think that might shock some people. Could, could you talk for a second about that? I could, I could do a Marvel yeah, he said if you were offered a Marvel, if you if you were offered a Marvel superhero movie, that you would do it. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a, it's a, it's a, such a, an incredible toy, you know, to make all these things. Uh, yeah, and it's it's for it's making films for teenagers or for kids. It's uh, it's it's a, it's a different audience, and uh, it's yeah, it's fantasy. It's uh, Probably I would have problem because they would they would they will think they will think that I will be good at it and I will probably transform it into something else because I cannot do anything else that the things I'm doing. Uh, but uh, it, I think it, yeah, it would be fun. I, I love I love I, I I can make films with really no money and but I have a lot of ideas how to spend money in very expensive films. So, um, <laughs> I, I really, it's a pleasure to do both. Uh, would you need to write that Marvel film so, in order to do it, or could it be a project that someone it. brought to you? Oh, no, no, I couldn't write it. Yeah, I couldn't write something like that because it's so, <laughs> the pattern is so strong, you know. It, it's, it's the kind of thing that you that you have to follow, you know, how you have to say, okay, I do, I do, um, I do a Batman film or anything. I do something like that. And it's like, yeah, you enter into the pattern that you didn't, uh, uh, you, pr you pretend to be, uh, 
in, 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 in that story, but, but they are so, yeah, they are so, uh, because they are, it's, it's more a myth, you know, like King Kong, like, uh, things like that. It's something mythical, myth, mythical. And it's, it, I think it could, it, it, it could be fun, but I'm probably too old to, <laughs> to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to see that happen. When you, when you I write, were younger uh, than you James Cameron, English? so I would argue that uh, if Kate, you'd be fine. <laughs> when you write, so you can write in English um, uh, or French, um, either way. Um, a mix. When it's a film in English, it's it's in French, and sometimes dialogues in English when they come like it when they come it. But the language is always very yeah. I, I think more in images than in in languages. You know my 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 mother is French speaking. My father is Flemish speaking. I grew up in Germany. I see films in English, so. Uh, Words are, are uh, words is a complex. It's a complex word, but an image works always in 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 in, in any language. Telling stories in with, with images is 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 the, is probably the thing that goes directly to the brain. You know? What uh, what are you working on now? When all of this stuff ends, when we all come out of COVID and lockdown, and and people are desperate to see original movies again, is there something that we can sort of whet their appetite with and say this is what Van Dormel has in store for you? Because it's been a few years, and I think people are ready again. Yeah, oh, I, I I'm writing since something like three years um, with a co-writer with Thomas Gunzik. Uh, a film about dreams. Um, but it's long. <laughs> it's long again. During the COVID, I made a short films with, uh, with, with, uh, with the just uh, still frames, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with photos, like La Jeté of uh, mm. something like that, you know, that tells the story about, about, uh, what my wife lived during the COVID, it's a, it's a 50, it's a, it's a 50 minutes, 15 minute short film. And I did also before, um, things in theater that are films that are, what can you call it? Ephemeral. You know, we come on the stage with cameras, with little, little toys, little sets and, uh, Okay, and we go, and for one hour, one hour, and one hour and a half, we tell a story uh, where nothing is recorded in advance, and it's fun too because it's a sort of storytelling where um, where you have to to make it cheap and easy. What is not my natural my natural uh, way, but I learned a lot with that because. By example, when, I, when, when we made um, the brand new Testament, it was too expensive, like usual, like always. And then we, we go through, through the sets and uh, we said, okay, what is expensive? By example, the camping in Spain in the, in the 50s. Uh, okay, and then we put some sand and some wind, toys, and we wrote camping in Spain, you know. And that was really cheap. And it's, but the story, it was still storytelling, you know, it was not reproducing, recreating a sort of real world. It's more, more making the audience imagine the real world, but you can see it's not real, you know, it's toy and it's cheap. So, and sometimes I have to, to learn to make cheap, like every, every director. In French, we say réalisateur. Uh, réalisateur is um, 
and uh, it's it's not the guy who directs, but the guy who is confronted with the reality. Yeah, it's uh, yes, you direct, but into the reality in, in which you are. You know, you try to make it real, but um, but you have to deal with reality. Most of the time, reality is uh, it's raining when it's um, when it's written sun. Uh, it's uh, it's it's too expensive and it's it takes too much time. So um, so the realizer, the guy who deals with the reality, has to find ideas how to make it fun with less money, with uh, uh, less money and more time, with uh, other ideas that are where the audience can can write. The script, because you know, in, in in cinema, often we say there are three, three. The, a film is written three times. It's written by the script. It's written on the shooting, and it's written rewritten in the editing room. But the first, the first, the first time it's written is, in my sense, the most important. It's rewritten by the audience, and everybody who sees the film re-edit it in his head and make a different film. And the film stays on the screen, but the real film leaves into the mind of the people who, who leave the theater and everybody has seen another film. And that's fun. That's fun. And so I never know what people... That is, see. I have never... So, uh, I have uh, never I, given it uh, that kind of thought. Uh, yeah, I often have it, especially when people come to me and say, I love your film. I don't know what they have seen. And if people come and say, I didn't like that film. I don't know what they have seen. And personally, I will never see my film. I know them by heart. I will never see them for the first time. So it's a sort of, yeah, I don't know what they have seen and I don't know myself what is the film, but if they like it, it's it's okay. Hmm. I think that's, that's a, that's a, a wonderful, wonderful place to stop. Jacques Van Dormel, thank um, you so much. Um, fantastic. Tim, did you have any other uh, final questions here? No, 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 no questions. I just that was just a wonderful thought. That you know, the, the, that fourth that fourth making of the film is, the, is one that we forget about, and um, it's fantastic. You're right. You never know what film somebody has seen. They it only exists inside their own head. It's fantastic. Thank you, Jack. It's a, it's a beautiful thank you, thought. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> Jacques Van Dormel, we thank you for all of your wonderful movies. And uh, here again, Toto the Hero from uh, from Arrow is now on Blu-ray. It is a beautiful set. Comes with this fantastic booklet as well, and um, it it belongs on every film collector and film lovers uh, DVD and Blu-ray shelf. I think uh, this is we've waited thirty years for this, and it's been worth the wait. So. Thank you, Jaco. Best of luck with uh, with your next film. We will sit and uh, wait with our fans and, and eagerly anticipate it. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, brother. Thank you.